Mr. Hungerton, her father, really was the most tactless person upon earth. A fluffy, feathery, untidy cockatoo of a man, perfectly good-natured, but absolutely centred upon his own silly self. If anything could have driven me from Gladys, it would have been the thought of such a father-in-law. I am convinced that he really believed in his heart that I came round to the chestnuts three days a week for the pleasure of his company, and very specially to hear his views upon bimetallism, a subject upon which he was by way of being an authority. For an hour or more that evening I listened to his monotonous chirrup about bad money driving out good, the token value of silver, the depreciation of the rupee, and the true standards of exchange. Then, suddenly, he bounced off out of the room to dress for a Masonic meeting, and at last I was alone with Gladys. The moment of fate had come. All that evening I had felt like the soldier who awaits the signal which will send him on a forlorn hope, hope of victory and fear of repulse alternating in his mind. Gladys was full of every womanly quality. Some judged her to be cold and hard, but such a thought was treason. That delicately bronzed skin, almost oriental in its colouring, that raven hair, the large liquid eyes, the full but exquisite lips, all the stigmata of passion were there. But I was sadly conscious that up to now I had never found the secret of drawing it forth. However, come what might, I should have done with suspense and bring matters to a head tonight. She could but refuse me, and better be a repulsed lover than an accepted brother. So far my thoughts had carried me, and I was about to break the long and uneasy silence, when two critical dark eyes looked round at me, and the proud head was shaken in smiling reproof. I have a presentiment that you are going to propose, Ned. I do wish you wouldn't, for things are so much nicer as they are. What a pity to spoil it. I drew my chair a little nearer. But why can't you love me, Gladys? Is it my appearance, or what? She did unbend a little. She put forward a hand. Such a gracious, stooping attitude it was and she pressed back my head. Then she looked into my upturned face with a very wistful smile. No, it isn't that, she said at last. You're not a conceited boy by nature, and so I can safely tell you that it is not that. It's deeper. My character? She nodded severely. Now tell me, what's amiss with me? I'm in love with somebody else, said she. It's nobody in particular. <laughs> She explained, laughing at the expression of my face, only an ideal. I've never met the kind of man I mean. Tell me about him. What does he look like? Oh, he might look very much like you. How dear of you to say that. Well, what is it that he does that I don't do? Just say the word. Teetotal, vegetarian, aeronaut, theosophist, superman. I'll have a try at it, Gladys, if you will only give me an idea what would please you. She laughed at the elasticity of my character. Well, in the first place, I don't think my ideal would speak like that, said she. He would be a harder, sterner man, not so ready to adapt himself to a silly girl's whim. But above all, he must be a man who could do, who could act, who would look death in the face and have no fear of him, a man of great deeds and strange experiences. It is never a man that I should love, but always the glories he had won, for they would be reflected upon me. There are heroisms all round us waiting to be done. It's for men to do them, and for women to reserve their love as a reward for such men. Look at that young Frenchman who went up last week in a balloon. It was blowing a gale of wind, but because he was announced to go, he insisted on starting. The wind blew him 1,500 miles in 24 hours, and he fell in the middle of Russia. That was the kind of man I mean. Think of the woman he loved, and how other women must have envied her. That's what I should like, to be envied for my man. Now, when you described the Wigan coal explosion last month, could you not have gone down and helped those people in spite of the choke damp? I did. You never said so. Well, there was nothing worth bucking about. I didn't know. She looked at me with rather more interest. That was brave of you. She gave me her hand, but with such sweetness and dignity that I could only stoop and kiss it. I dare say I am merely a foolish woman with a young girl's fancies, and yet it is so real with me, so entirely part of my very self, that I cannot help acting upon it. If I marry, 
I do want to marry a famous man. Why should you not, I cried. It is women like you who brace men up. Give me a chance and see if I will take it. Besides, as you say, men ought to make their own chances and not wait until they are given. Look at Clive. Just a clerk, and he conquered India. By George, I'll do something in the world yet. She laughed at my sudden Irish effervescence. Why not, she said. You have everything a man could have. Youth, health, strength, education, energy. I was sorry you spoke, and now I am glad, so glad, if it wakens these thoughts in you. And if I do... Her hand rested like warm velvet upon my lips. Not another word, sir. You should have been at the office for evening duty half an hour ago, only I hadn't the heart to remind you. Some day, perhaps, when you have won your place in the world, we shall talk it over again. And so it was that I found myself that foggy November evening pursuing the Camberwell tram with my heart glowing within me and with the eager determination that not another day should elapse before I should find some deed which was worthy of my lady. But who in all this wide world could ever have imagined the incredible shape which that deed was to take, or the strange steps by which I was led to the doing of it? Behold me, then, at the office of the Daily Gazette, on the staff of which I was a most insignificant unit with the settled determination that very night, if possible, to find the quest which would be worthy of my Gladys. Was it hardness, was it selfishness, that she should ask me to risk my life for her own glorification? Such thoughts may come to middle age, but never to ardent three and twenty in the fever of his first love. I always liked McArdle the crabbed, old, round-backed, red-headed news editor, and I rather hoped that he liked me. He nodded as I entered the room. Well, Mr. Malone, from all I hear, you seem to be doing very well, he said. The colliery explosion was excellent. So was the Southwark fire. You seem to have the true descriptive touch. What did you want to see me about? Do you think, sir, that you could possibly send me on some mission for the paper? Anything that had adventure and danger in it, the more difficult it was, the better it would suit me. Dear me, Mr. Malone, this is very exalted. I'm afraid the day for this sort of thing is rather past. The expense of the special mission hardly justifies the result. Wait a bit, though. What about exposing a fraud? A modern Munchausen, and making him ridiculous? You could show him up as the liar he is. Why not try your luck with Professor Challenger of Enmore Park? I dare say I looked a little startled. Challenger, I cried. Professor Challenger, the famous zoologist? Wasn't he the man who broke the skull of Blundell of the Telegraph? The news editor smiled grimly. Do you mind? Didn't you say it was adventures you were after? It's all in the way of business, sir, I answered. Exactly. I don't suppose he can always be as violent as that. I have a few notes for your guidance, Mr. Malone. He took a paper from a drawer. Here is a summary of his record. Challenger, George Edward, born Largs, 1863. Educated Largs Academy. Edinburgh University. British Museum Assistant, 1892. Assistant Keeper of Comparative Anthropology Department, 1893. Resigned after acrimonious correspondence, same year. Winner of Creston Medal for Zoological Research. Foreign member of, well, quite a lot of things. Publications, some observations about a series of Kalmuck skulls, outlines of vertebrate evolution, and numerous papers including the underlying fallacy of Weissmannism, which caused heated discussion at the Zoological Congress of Vienna. Recreations, walking, alpine climbing. I pocketed the slip of paper. One moment, sir, I said. I am not yet very clear why I am to interview this gentleman. What has he done? I went to South America on a solitary expedition two years ago. Came back last year and began to tell his adventures in a vague way. Rank nonsense about some queer animals he had discovered. Something wonderful happened, or the man's a champion liar, which is the more probable supposition. Had some damaged photographs, said to be fakes. 
got so touchy that he assaults anyone who asks questions and heaves reporters down the stairs. In my opinion, he's just a homicidal maniac with a turn for science. That's your man, Mr. Malone. Half an hour later, I was seated with a huge tome in front of me, opened at the article, Weissmann vs. Darwin, Spirited Protest at Vienna. I was unable to follow the whole argument, but it was evident that the English professor had handled his subject in a very aggressive fashion, and had thoroughly annoyed his continental colleagues. The words protest, uproar, and appeal to the chairman caught my eye. The rest might have been written in Chinese for all the meaning that it conveyed to my brain. I decided to try my luck with a letter to Challenger. Dear Professor Challenger, it said, as a humble student of nature, I have always taken the most profound interest in your speculations as to the differences between Darwin and Weissmann. I have recently had occasion to refresh my memory by rereading your masterly address at Vienna. That lucid and admirable statement seems to be the last word in the matter. There is one sentence in it, however, namely, I protest strongly against the insufferable and entirely dogmatic assertion that each separate id is a microcosm of an historical architecture elaborated slowly through the series of generations. Have you no desire, in view of later research, to modify this statement? Do you not think that it is over-accentuated? With your permission, I would ask the favour of an interview, as I feel strongly upon the subject and have certain suggestions which I could only elaborate in a personal conversation. With your consent, I trust to have the honour of calling at eleven o'clock the day after tomorrow, Wednesday morning. I remain, sir, with assurances of profound respect, yours very truly, Edward D. Malone. On Wednesday there was a letter for me, with the West Kensington postmark upon it, and my name scrawled across the envelope in a handwriting which looked like a barbed wire railing. Enmore Park, West. Sir, I have duly received your note, in which you claim to endorse my views, although I am not aware that they are dependent upon endorsement either from you or anyone else. You have ventured to use the word speculation with regard to my statement upon the subject of Darwinism, and I would call your attention to the fact that such a word in such a connection is offensive to a degree. The context convinces me, however, that you have sinned rather through ignorance and tactlessness than through malice, so I am content to pass the matter by. You quote an isolated sentence from my lecture, and appear to have some difficulty in understanding it. I should have thought that only a subhuman intelligence could have failed to grasp the point, but if it really needs amplification, I shall consent to see you at the hour named, though visits and visitors of every sort are exceedingly distasteful to me. As to your suggestion that I may modify my opinion, I would have you know that it is not my habit to do so after a deliberate expression of my mature views. You will kindly show the envelope of this letter to my man, Austin, when you call, as he has to take every precaution to shield me from the intrusive rascals who call themselves journalists. Yours faithfully, George Edward Challenger. A taxicab took me round in good time for my appointment. It was an imposing porticoed house at which we stopped, giving every indication of wealth. The door was opened by an odd, swarthy, dried-up person of uncertain age. Expected? he asked. I produced the envelope. Right. Following him down the passage, I was interrupted by a vivacious, dark-eyed lady, more French than English in her type. One moment, she said. Have you met my husband before? No, madam, I have not had that honour. Then I apologise to you in advance. I must tell you that he is a perfectly impossible person. Get quickly out of the room if he seems inclined to be violent. Don't wait to argue with him. Several people have been injured through doing that. You won't believe a word he says about South America. I'm sure I don't wonder. But don't tell him so, for it makes him very violent. You remember, he believes it himself. A more honest man never lived. If you find him really dangerous, ring the bell and hold him off until I come. Even at his worst, I can usually control him. With these encouraging words, the lady left me, and I was conducted to the end of the passage. 
There was a tap at the door, a bull's bellow from within, and I was face to face with the professor. He sat behind a broad table covered with books, maps, and diagrams. His size and his imposing presence took one's breath away. His head was the largest I've ever seen upon a human being. He had the face and beard which I associate with an Assyrian bull. The face florid, the beard so black as almost to have a suspicion of blue. A huge spread of shoulders, a chest like a barrel, and two enormous hands, covered with long black hair, with the other parts of him which appeared above the table. Well, said he with a most insolent stare, what now? You were good enough to give me an appointment, sir. Oh, you are the young person who cannot understand plain English, are you? You have, I believe, some comments to make upon the proposition which I advanced in my thesis. He transfixed me with two sharp, steely eyes. I am, of course, a mere student, said I, with a fatuous smile. He leaned forward with great earnestness. I suppose you are aware, said he, checking off points upon his fingers, that the cranial index is a constant factor. Oh, naturally, said I. And that telegony is still sub judice? Undoubtedly. And that the germplasm is different from the parthenogenetic egg? Why, surely, I cried, and gloried in my own audacity. But what does that prove? he asked in a gentle, persuasive voice. Ah, what indeed, I murmured, what does it prove? Shall I tell you? he cooed. Pray do. It proves, he roared with a sudden blast of fury, that you are the rankest impostor in London. A vile, crawling journalist who has no more science than he has decency in his composition. He had sprung to his feet with a mad rage in his eyes. Even at that moment of tension, I found time for amazement at the discovery that he was quite a short man. His head not higher than my shoulder. A stunted Hercules, whose tremendous vitality had all run to depth, breadth, and brain. Gibberish! he cried, leaning forward, with his fingers on the table and his face projecting. That's what I've been talking to you, sir. Scientific gibberish! Do you think you could match cunning with me? You with your walnut of a brain? You think you are omnipotent, you infernal scribblers? Look here, sir, said I, backing to the door and opening it. You can be as abusive as you like, but there is a limit. You shall not assault me. Shall I not? He was slowly advancing in a peculiar, menacing way, but he stopped now and put his big hands into the side pockets of a rather boyish short jacket which he wore. Don't be such a fool, Professor, I cried. What can you hope for? I'm fifteen stone, as hard as nails, and play centre three-quarter every Saturday for London Irish. I'm not the man... It was at that moment that he rushed me. It was lucky that I had opened the door, or we should have gone through it. We did a Catherine wheel together down the passage. Somehow we gathered up a chair upon our way and bounded on with it towards the street. We went with a back somersault down the front steps and rolled into the gutter. Then a policeman was beside us, notebook in hand. What's all this? he asked. This man attacked me, I said. Not the first time either, said the policeman, shaking his head. Do you give him in charge, sir? I relented. No, I said, I do not. I was to blame myself. I intruded upon him. The policeman snapped up his notebook. Don't let us have any more such goings on, he said, and clumped heavily down the street. The professor looked at me, and there was something humorous at the back of his eyes. Come in, said he. I've not done with you yet. The speech had a sinister sound, but I followed him into the house. Hardly had the door closed behind us than Mrs. Challenger darted out from the dining room. You brute, George, she screamed. You've hurt that nice young man. Where is your dignity? You, a man who should have been Regius Professor at a great university, you have become a common brawling ruffian. That's done it. Stool of penance, said he. To my amazement, he stooped, 
picked her up and placed her on a high pedestal of black marble in the angle of the hall. Let me down, she wailed. Really, sir, said I, looking at the lady. Say please, Jessie, and down you come, Challenger said. Oh, you brute, please, please. He took her down as if she had been a canary and gave her a resounding kiss, which embarrassed me even more than his violence had done. Run away, little woman, and don't fret. Now, Mr. Malone, this way, if you please. We re-entered the room which we had left so tumultuously. The professor motioned me into an armchair and pushed a cigar box under my nose. Excitable people like you are the better for narcotics, he said, looking at me with his insolent eyes. Round-headed, he muttered. Brachycephalic, grey eyes, black-haired, Celtic, I presume. I am an Irishman, sir. Irish? Ah, that, of course, explains it. He scratched about among the litter of papers on his desk and faced me presently with what looked like a tattered sketchbook in his hand. The subspecies of human race to which you unfortunately belong has always been below my mental horizon. But I seem to discern in your answer to that most officious policeman some glimmering of good feeling on your part. You swam up into my serious notice. Now, I am going to talk to you about South America. No comments, if you please, and I wish you to understand that nothing I tell you now is to be repeated in any public way, unless you have my express permission. Is that clear? Yes, I promise. Very well. In the first place, you are probably aware that two years ago I made a journey to South America, one which will be classical in the history of the scientific world. You are also probably aware that the country around some parts of the Amazon is still only partially explored, and a great number of its tributaries entirely uncharted. It was my business to visit this little-known back country and to examine its fauna to furnish materials for that great and monumental work upon zoology which will be my life's justification. I spent a night at a small Indian village. I was summoned by the chief to one of the huts where a white man had that instant expired. His name was on a tab in his knapsack. Maple White, Lake Avenue, Detroit, Michigan. It is a name to which I am always prepared to lift my hat. In this American's jacket was his sketchbook, and I can assure you that a first folio of Shakespeare could not be treated with greater reverence than this relic has been since it came into my possession. I hand it to you now and ask you to examine the contents. Challenger helped himself to a cigar and leaned back as I opened the volume. The first page was disappointing, a picture of a very fat man with the legend Jimmy Culver on the mail boat written underneath. Then several pages filled with sketches of Indians, followed by studies of women and babies and a series of animal drawings. I could make nothing of them and said so to the professor. He smiled serenely. Try the next page said he. It was a full-page sketch of a landscape, with a foreground of feathery vegetation which sloped upwards and ended in a line of cliffs, dark red in colour and curiously ribbed like some basaltic formations I have seen. At one point was an isolated pyramidal rock crowned by a great tree. A curious formation, said I. It is unique, he said. It is incredible. Now, the next page. I turned it over and gave an exclamation of surprise. There was a full-page picture of the most extraordinary creature that I had ever seen. It was the wild dream of an opium smoker, a vision of delirium. The head was like that of a fowl, the body that of a bloated lizard, the trailing tail was furnished with upward-turned spikes, and the curved back was edged with a high serrated fringe which looked like a dozen cock's wattles placed behind each other. In front of this creature was an absurd mannequin, or dwarf in human form, who stood staring at it. 
Well, what do you think of that? cried the professor, rubbing his hands with an air of triumph. It is monstrous, grotesque. But what made him draw such an animal? Trade gin, I should think. Oh, that's the best explanation you could give, is it? Well, sir, what is yours? The obvious one, that the creature exists, that it is actually sketched from the life. I should have laughed, only that I had a vision of our doing another Catherine wheel down the passage. No doubt, said I, no doubt, as one humours an imbecile. But this tiny human figure puzzles me. If it is drawn to scale, then Charing Cross Station would hardly make a kennel for such a brute. As a man of science, you surely cannot take as evidence a single sketch by a wandering American artist who may have done it under hashish or in the delirium of fever. For answer, the professor took down a book from a shelf. This is an excellent monograph by my gifted friend, Ray Lancaster, said he. There is an illustration here which would interest you. Ah, yes, here it is. The inscription beneath it runs... Probable appearance in life of the Jurassic dinosaur Stegosaurus. The hind leg alone is twice as tall as a full-grown man. Well, what do you make of that? He handed me the open book. I started as I looked at the picture. In this reconstructed animal of a dead world, there was certainly a very great resemblance to the sketch of the unknown artist. That is certainly remarkable, said I. Very well said the professor. Now, would you kindly look at this? He handed me a photograph, half plate size. The unsatisfactory appearance of it is due to the fact that on descending the river, the boat was upset and the case containing the films was broken open. This is one of the few which partially escaped. The photograph was certainly very off-coloured, an unkind critic might easily have misinterpreted that dim surface. It was a dull grey landscape, and as I gradually deciphered the details of it, I realised that it represented a long and enormously high line of cliffs, exactly like an immense cataract seen in the distance, with a sloping tree-clad plain in the foreground. I believe it is the same place as the painted picture, said I. It is the same place, the professor answered. I found traces of the fellow's camp. Now, look at this. It was a nearer view of the same scene, though the photograph was extremely defective. I could distinctly see the isolated tree-crowned pinnacle of rock which was detached from the crag. I have no doubt of it at all, said I. Well, that is something gained, said he. We progress, do we not? Now, will you please look at the top of that rocky pinnacle? Do you observe something there? An enormous tree. But on the tree. A large bird, said I. He handed me a lens. Yes, I said, peering through it. A large bird stands on the tree. It appears to have a considerable beak. I should say it was a pelican. I cannot congratulate you upon your eyesight, said the professor. It is not a pelican, nor indeed is it a bird. It may interest you to know that I succeeded in shooting that particular specimen. It was the only absolute proof of my experiences which I was able to bring away with me. You have it, then? Here at last was tangible corroboration. I had it. It was unfortunately lost with so much else in the same boat accident which ruined my photographs. I clutched at it as it disappeared in the swirl of the rapids, and part of its wing was left in my hand. From a drawer, he produced what seemed to me to be the upper portion of the wing of a large bat. It was at least two feet in length, a curved bone with a membranous veil beneath it. A monstrous bat, I suggested. Nothing of the sort, said the professor severely. He opened the standard work of reference. Here, said he, pointing to the picture of an extraordinary flying monster, is an excellent reproduction of the Dimorphodon, or Pterodactyl, a flying reptile of the Jurassic period. On the next page is a diagram of the mechanism of its wing. Kindly compare it with the specimen in your hand. A wave of amazement passed over me as I looked. I was convinced there could be no getting away from it. 
the cumulative proof was overwhelming. The sketch, the photographs, the narrative, and now the actual specimen. The evidence was complete. I said so. I said so warmly, for I felt that the professor was an ill-used man. He leaned back in his chair with drooping eyelids and a tolerant smile, basking in this sudden gleam of sunshine. It's just the very biggest thing that I ever heard of, said I, though it was my journalistic rather than my scientific enthusiasm that was roused. It is colossal. You are a Columbus of science who has discovered a lost world. I'm really awfully sorry if I seem to doubt you. It was all so unthinkable. But I understand evidence when I see it, and this should be good enough for anyone. The professor purred with satisfaction. But how do you account for all this? There can be only one explanation, said the professor. South America is a granite continent. In some far distant age, a great volcanic upheaval has lifted up an area as large as Sussex with all its living contents. Cut off by perpendicular precipices from the rest of the continent, the ordinary laws of nature are suspended. Creatures survive which would otherwise disappear. The pterodactyl and the stegosaurus are Jurassic, and therefore of a great age in the order of life. They have been artificially conserved by those strange accidental conditions. But surely your evidence is conclusive, I said. You have only to lay it before the proper authorities. So, in my simplicity, I had imagined, replied the professor bitterly. But I was met at every turn by incredulity, born partly of stupidity and partly of jealousy. I am, I admit, somewhat fiery, and when men like yourself, representing the foolish curiosity of the public, came to disturb my privacy, I was inclined to be violent. I fear you may have remarked it. I was silent. The professor handed me a card from his desk. You will perceive that Mr. Percival Waldron, a naturalist of some popular repute, is to lecture tonight upon the record of the ages. I propose to give an example of my self-restraint. I have been invited to move a vote of thanks, and while doing so, I shall make it my business with infinite tact and delicacy to throw out a few remarks indicating that there are greater depths beyond. I shall be pleased to see you at the lecture tonight. In the meantime, Mr. Malone, I leave it to you that nothing of all this appears in print. Very good. Then the Zoological Institute's Hall at 8.30 tonight. And he waved me out of the room. I was a somewhat demoralized journalist by the time I found myself at the office again. McCardle was at his post as usual. Well, he cried expectantly, what may it run to? I'll show him up for the fraud he is. But he's not a fraud at all, I said. What? roared McCardle. You don't mean to say that you really believe this stuff about mammoths and mastodons and great sea serpents? Well, I don't know about that. I don't think he makes any claims of that kind, but I do believe he has got something new. Then for heaven's sake, man, write it up. I'm longing to, but all I know he gave me in confidence and on condition that I didn't. I condensed into a few sentences the professor's narrative. That's how it stands. McCardle looked deeply incredulous. Well, Mr. Malone, he said at last, about the scientific meeting tonight, there can be no privacy about that, anyhow. I don't suppose any paper will want to report it, for Waldron has been reported already a dozen times, and no one is aware that Challenger will speak. We may get a scoop if we are lucky. You'll be there in any case, so you'll just give us a pretty full report. I'll keep space up to midnight. When I arrived at the hall, I found a much greater concourse than I had expected. A line of electric brooms discharged their little cargoes of white-bearded professors, but it was evident that a youthful and even boyish spirit was abroad in the gallery and the back of the hall, where I could see rows of medical students. They gave a yell of welcome when my new acquaintance, Professor Challenger, passed down to take his place at the extreme end of the front row of the platform. Eventually... Mr. Waldron, the famous popular lecturer, rose amid a general murmur of applause. 
He was a stern man with an aggressive manner, but he had the merit of knowing how to pass ideas on in a way which was intelligible and even interesting to the lay public. It was a bird's-eye view of creation, as interpreted by science, which in language always clear and sometimes picturesque he unfolded before us. He told us of the globe, a huge mass of flaming gas flaring through the heavens. Then he pictured the solidification, the cooling, the wrinkling which formed the mountains, the steam which turned to water, the slow preparation of the stage upon which was to be played, the inexplicable drama of life. On the origin of life itself he was discreetly vague. That the germs of it could hardly have survived the original roasting was, he declared, fairly certain. This brought the lecturer to the great ladder of animal life, beginning low down in mollusks and feeble sea creatures, then up, rung by rung, through reptiles and fishes, till at last we came to a kangaroo rat, a creature which brought forth its young alive, the direct ancestor of all mammals, and presumably, therefore, of everyone in the audience. No, no, from a sceptical student in the back row. If the young gentleman in the red tie, who cried no, no, and who presumably claimed to have been hatched out of an egg, would wait upon him after the lecture, he would be glad to see such a curiosity. Laughter. Having thus, amid a general titter, played very prettily with his interrupter, the lecturer went back to his picture of the past. The drying of the seas, the emergence of the sand bank, the sluggish, viscous life which lay upon their margins, the overcrowded lagoons, the tendency of the sea creatures to take refuge upon the mud flats, the abundance of food awaiting them, their consequent enormous growth. Hence, ladies and gentlemen, he added, that frightful brood of saurians which still affright our eyes when seen in the Wielden or in the Solenhofen slates, but which were fortunately extinct long before the first appearance of mankind upon this planet. Question! boomed a voice from the platform. Mr. Waldron paused for a moment and then repeated slowly, which were extinct before the coming of man. Question! boomed the voice once more. Waldron looked with amazement along the line of professors upon the platform until his eyes fell upon the figure of Challenger, who leaned back in his chair with closed eyes and an amused expression as if he were smiling in his sleep. I see, said Waldron with a shrug. It is my friend Professor Challenger. And amid laughter he renewed his lecture as if this was a final explanation and no more need be said. But the incident was far from being closed. Whatever path the lecturer took amid the wilds of the past seemed invariably to lead him to some assertion as to extinct or prehistoric life, which instantly brought the same bull's bellow from the professor. The audience began to anticipate it and to roar with delight when it came. Waldron, though a hardened lecturer and a strong man, became rattled. He hesitated, stammered, repeated himself, got snarled in a long sentence, and finally turned furiously upon the cause of his troubles. This really is intolerable, he cried, glaring across the platform. I must ask you, Professor Challenger, to cease these ignorant and unmannerly interruptions. There was a hush over the hall. The students, rigid with delight at seeing the high gods on Olympus quarrelling among themselves, Challenger levered his bulky figure slowly out of his chair. I must in turn ask you, Mr. Waldron, he said, to cease to make assertions which are not in strict accordance with scientific fact. The words unloosed a tempest. Shame, shame, give him a hearing. Professor Challenger smiled and relapsed into his chair. At last, the lecture came to an end, and Waldron sat down. After a chirrup from the chairman, Professor Challenger rose and advanced to the edge of the platform. Ladies and gentlemen, he began, I have been selected to move a vote of thanks to Mr. Waldron for the very picturesque and imaginative address to which we have just listened. There are points in it with which I disagree, and it has been my duty to indicate them as they arose. 
I speak as an original investigator, and I say that Mr. Waldron is very wrong in supposing that because he himself has never seen a so-called prehistoric animal, therefore these creatures no longer exist. They can still be found, if one has but the energy and hardihood to seek their haunts. Creatures which were supposed to be Jurassic still exist. Cries of Bosch, how do you know? I know because I have visited their secret haunts. I know because I have seen some of them. Applause, uproar, and a cry of liar. Did I hear someone say that I was a liar? If I come down among you... The professor, with his face flushed, was now in a proper berserk mood. The assembly was reduced to absolute chaos. White-bearded men rose and shook their fists. The professor raised both his hands, and gradually the shouting died away before his commanding gesture. I will not detain you, he said. It is not worth it. Truth is truth, and the noise of a number of foolish young men, and I fear I must add of their equally foolish seniors, cannot affect the matter. I claim that I have opened a new field of science. You dispute it. Cheers from the audience followed this. Then I put you to the test. Will you accredit one or more of your own number? to go out as your representatives and test my statement in your name? Mr. Summerlee, the veteran professor of comparative anatomy, rose among the audience, a tall, thin, bitter man with the withered aspect of a theologian. He wished, he said, to ask Professor Challenger whether the results to which he had alluded in his remarks had been obtained during a journey to the headwaters of the Amazon made by him two years before. Professor Challenger answered that they had. Mr. Summerlee desired to know how it was that Professor Challenger claimed to have made discoveries in those regions which had been overlooked by Wallace, Bates, and other previous explorers of established scientific repute. Professor Challenger answered that Mr. Summerley appeared to be confusing the Amazon with the Thames, that it was in reality a somewhat larger river, that Mr. Summerley might be interested to know that with the Orinoco, which communicated with it, some 50,000 miles of country were opened up, and that in so vast a space it was not impossible for one person to find what another had missed. Mr. Summerlee declared with an acid smile that he fully appreciated the difference between the Thames and the Amazon, which lay in the fact that any assertion about the former could be tested, while about the latter it could not. He would be obliged if Professor Challenger would give the latitude and the longitude of the country in which prehistoric animals were to be found. Professor Challenger replied that he reserved such information for good reasons of his own, but would be prepared to give it with proper precautions to a committee chosen from the audience. Would Mr. Summerlee serve on such a committee and test his story in person? Mr. Summerlee? Yes, I will. Great cheering. Professor Challenger, then I guarantee that I will place in your hands such material as will enable you to find your way. It is only right, however, since Mr. Summerlee goes to check my statement, that I should have one or more with him who may check his. I will not disguise from you that there are difficulties and dangers. Mr. Summerlee will need a younger colleague. May I ask for volunteers? It is thus that the great crisis of a man's life springs out at him. Was this not the very opportunity of which Gladys had spoken? I sprung to my feet at the same time as a tall, thin man with dark, gingery hair, a few seats in front of me. We were both trying to be heard at once. I will go, Mr. Chairman, I kept repeating over and over again. Name, name, cried the audience. My name is Edward Dunn Malone. I am the reporter of the Daily Gazette. I claim to be an absolutely unprejudiced witness. What is your name, sir? The chairman asked of my tall rival. I am Lord John Roxton. I have already been up the Amazon. I know all the ground and have special qualifications for this investigation. 
Lord John Roxton's reputation as a sportsman and a traveller is, of course, world famous, said the chairman. At the same time, it would certainly be as well to have a member of the press upon such an expedition. Then I move, said Professor Challenger, that both these gentlemen be elected as representatives of this meeting to accompany Professor Summerlee upon his journey to investigate and to report upon the truth of my statement. And so, amid shouting and cheering, our fate was decided, and I found myself borne away in the human current which swirled towards the door, with my mind stunned by the vast new project which had risen before it. Suddenly, there was a touch at my elbow. I turned and found myself looking into the humorous, masterful eyes of the tall, thin man who had volunteered to be my companion on this strange quest. Mr. Malone, I understand, said he. We are to be companions, what? My rooms are just over the road in Albany. Perhaps you would have the kindness to spare me half an hour, for there are one or two things that I badly want to say to you. Lord John Roxton and I turned down Vigo Street together, through the dingy portals of the famous aristocratic rookery, along a drab passage and into a large room. Amid the luxurious ornaments and pictures were trophies, which reminded me that the famous Lord John Roxton, now seated opposite to me, was one of the great all-round sportsmen and athletes of his day. In figure, he was spare, but very strongly built, capable of sustained exertion. He handed me a long, smooth Havana. By the way, he said, are you by any chance the Malone who is expected to get his rugby cap for Ireland? I nodded. Thought I remembered your face. Well, to business. There's a boat for Para next Wednesday week, and I think we should take it. Very good. Now, can you shoot? About average. I'll see what I can spare you out of my own battery, he said, crossing to a cupboard and taking out a succession of beautiful rifles. By the way, he continued, what do you know of this Professor Challenger? I never saw him till today. Neither did I. Funny we should both sail under sealed orders from a man we don't know. He seemed an uppish old bird, but I believe every single word he said to you was the truth. I've been up and down South America from end to end. It's the grandest bit of earth on this planet. Why shouldn't something wonderful lie there? It was quite late when I left him oiling his favourite rifle and chuckling at the thought of the adventures awaiting us. Not in all England, I reflected, could I have found a cooler head or braver spirit with which to share the dangers that lay before us. I had to explain the whole situation to McArdle, the news editor, it was agreed that I should write home full accounts of my adventures to be published by the Gazette, but not until my return, and then with no particulars as to our exact destination. The observance of these conditions was insisted upon by Professor Challenger, who came to see us off on a wet, foggy morning in the late spring. My directions are in this sealed envelope, he said. You will open it when you reach a town upon the Amazon, which is called Manaus but not until the date and hour which is marked on the outside. Goodbye to you, Mr. Malone. You have done something to mitigate my feelings for the loathsome profession to which you unhappily belong. Goodbye, Lord John. Science is, as I understand, a sealed book to you, but you may congratulate yourself upon the hunting field which awaits you. And goodbye to you also, Professor Summerlee. If you are still capable of self-improvement, of which I am frankly unconvinced, you will surely return to London a wiser man. So he turned upon his heel, and soon afterwards we were on our way down the channel. I will not bore those whom this narrative may reach by an account of our luxurious voyage upon the Booth liner across the Atlantic, or our river journey by steamer upstream to Manaus. Though in his sixty-sixth year, Professor Summerlee turned out to be better equipped for a rough expedition of this sort than one would imagine at first sight. His tall, stringy figure is insensible to fatigue, and his dry, unsympathetic manner is uninfluenced by any change in his surroundings. Lord John Roxton, twenty years younger, has something of the same spare, scraggy physique. Like most men of action, he is laconic in speech, with a gentle voice and quiet manner. He spoke little of his exploits in Brazil and Peru, 
But the Riverine natives looked upon the Red Chief, as they called him, as their champion and protector, on account of his campaign against Pedro Lopez, leader of the slave drivers. At Para, we enrolled certain retainers. The first, a gigantic Negro named Zambo, who is a black Hercules, as willing as a horse and about as intelligent. There also we engaged two half-breeds, Gomez and Manuel, swarthy fellows as active and wiry as panthers. Gomez had the advantage of speaking excellent English. Besides these, there were three Indians from Bolivia, Mojo, Jose and Fernando. Three white men then, two half-breeds, one Negro and three Indians made up the personnel of the little expedition which lay waiting for its instructions at Manaus, before starting upon its singular quest. At last, the day and the hour stipulated by Professor Challenger had come, twelve o'clock precisely, on July the 15th. Lord John opened the sealed envelope, and from it drew a folded sheet of paper. This he carefully opened out. It was a blank sheet. We looked at each other in a bewildered silence. "'May I come in?' boomed a voice from the veranda. And Challenger, in a straw hat with a coloured ribbon, appeared before us. He shook hands with myself and Lord John, and bowed with ponderous insolence to Professor Summerlee. "'You must forgive my little rules,' he said, "'but it was better I should direct my own movements. From henceforth I take command of this expedition. You are in safe hands. You will not now fail to reach your destination.' Is all ready for your journey? We can start tomorrow, replied Lord John. Lord John had chartered a large steam launch, the Esmeralda, and for three days we steamed northwestwards up a stream which, even a thousand miles from its mouth, was still so enormous that from its centre the two banks were mere shadows upon the distant skyline. On the fourth day after leaving Manaus, we turned into a tributary, which narrowed rapidly, and after two days more steaming we landed at an Indian village. There the professor insisted that the Esmeralda should be sent back to Manaus, since we should soon come upon rapids which would make its further use impossible. One of our Indians had to be sent home because of injury. Our English-speaking half-breed, Gomez, caught in the act of eavesdropping by our Negro Zambo, whipped out his knife, and, but for the huge strength of his captor, which enabled him to disarm him with one hand, would certainly have stabbed him. The feuds of the two learned men, Challenger and Summerlee, are continuous and bitter. For our journey into the unknown, we divided our personnel into two canoes, taking the obvious precaution of putting one professor in each, and began to make our way up a good-sized river, some hundreds of yards broad. Twice we had to make a portage of half a mile or so to avoid rapids. How shall I ever forget the solemn mystery of it? The trees shooting upwards in magnificent columns above our heads, then throwing out their side branches into gothic curves which coalesced to form one great matted roof of verdure. At dawn and at sunset the howler monkeys screamed together and the parakeets broke into shrill chatter. On the third day out, we were aware of a singular deep throbbing in the air. Our Indians appeared terrified. War drums, said Lord John carelessly. I've heard them before. Yes, sir, war drums, said Gomez. Wild Indians. They watch us every mile of the way. Kill us if they can. There was something indescribably nerve-shaking and menacing in that constant throbbing, which came from various points. It seemed to say, we will kill you if we can, we will kill you if we can. No one ever moved in the silent woods. I learned, however, that Summerlee and Challenger possessed that highest type of bravery, the bravery of the scientific mind. All day our two professors watched every bird upon the wing and every shrub upon the bank, with many a sharp, wordy contention but with no more sense of danger than if they were seated together in the smoking-room of the Royal Society's Club in St. James's Street. As we pushed upon our way, the drum-beating died out behind us. We came to a very steep rapid. 
the very one in which Professor Challenger had suffered disaster upon his first journey. The sight of it was really the first direct corroboration of the truth of his story. The next day, we made the great departure. Professor Challenger, who had been continually scanning each bank of the river, gave an exclamation of satisfaction and pointed to a single tree projecting over the side of the stream. That is my landmark, he said. There is a secret opening half a mile onwards. That is my private gate into the unknown. Push through and you will understand. Having reached the spot, we poled our canoes through light green rushes until we emerged into a placid and shallow stream, running clear and transparent over a sandy bottom. It was the most wonderful fairyland. The thick vegetation on each side met overhead, interlacing into a natural pergola. Bird life was abundant, and the crystal water alive with fish of every colour. For three days we made our way up this tunnel of hazy green sunshine, until we reached the highest point to which the canoes could be brought. We concealed them among the bushes, distributed the various burdens, and set forth upon the more laborious stage of our journey. Our two pepper pots continued to quarrel, but by some good fortune Lord John and I, the two sane men, discovered that both our savants had the poorest opinion of Dr. Illingworth of Edinburgh. Every strained situation was relieved by introducing the name of the Scottish zoologist, which would unite both our professors in their detestation and abuse of this common rival. On the second day, after leaving our canoes, we found that the character of the country changed. Our road was persistently upwards, and as we ascended, the woods became thinner and lost their tropical luxuriance. On the ninth day after leaving the canoes, we began to emerge from the trees into an immense wilderness of bamboo, which we could only penetrate by cutting a pathway with the machetes of the Indians. Several times we heard the plunging of large, heavy animals quite close to us. Wild cattle, said Lord John. When we cleared the wall of bamboo, there was an open plain in front of us, sloping slightly upwards towards low hills dotted with clumps of tree ferns. It was here that an incident occurred which may or may not have been important. Professor Challenger, who, with the two local Indians, was in the van of the party, stopped suddenly and pointed excitedly to the right. As he did so, we saw, at the distance of a mile or so, something which appeared to be a huge grey bird flap slowly up from the ground and skim smoothly off, flying very low and straight until it was lost among the tree ferns. Did you see it? cried Challenger in exultation. Summerly, did you see it? His colleague was staring at the spot where the creature had disappeared. What do you claim that it was? he asked. To the best of my belief, pterodactyl. Summerly burst into derisive laughter. A terror fiddlestick, said he. It was a stork, if ever I saw one. Challenger was too furious to speak. He simply swung his pack upon his back and continued upon his march. Lord John came abreast of me, however, and his face was more grave than was his wont. He had his Zeiss glasses in his hand. I focused it before it got over the trees, said he. I won't undertake to say what it was, but I'll risk my reputation as a sportsman that it wasn't any bird that ever I clapped eyes on in my life. So there the matter stands. Are we really just at the edge of the unknown, encountering the outlying pickets of this lost world of which our leader speaks? I give you the incident as it occurred, and you will know as much as I do. It stands alone, for we saw nothing more which could be called remarkable. And now, my readers, if ever I have any, I have brought you up the broad river and through the screen of rushes and down the green tunnel and up the long slope of palm trees and through the bamboo brake and across the plain of tree ferns. And now our destination lay in full sight. There before us lay the line of high red cliffs which I had seen in the picture. There can be no question that it is the same, curving away and stretching as far as I can see. Challenger struts about like a prize peacock, and Summerley is silent but still sceptical. Another day should bring some of our doubts to an end. 
I send this letter back in charge of Jose, whose arm was pierced by a broken bamboo. A dreadful thing has happened to us. Who could have foreseen it? I cannot foresee any end to our troubles. It may be that we are condemned to spend our whole lives in this strange, inaccessible place. We are as far from any human aid as if we were in the moon. But I have, as companions, three remarkable men, men of great brain power and of unshaken courage. There lies our one and only hope. We approached the enormous line of ruddy cliffs, which encircled beyond all doubt that plateau of which Professor Challenger spoke. Their height seemed to me in some places to run up to at least a thousand feet, and they were curiously striated, in a manner characteristic of basaltic upheavals. The summit showed signs of luxuriant vegetation, but there was no indication of any life that we could see. The crags above us were not merely perpendicular, but curved outwards at the top, so that ascent was out of the question. Close to us was a high, thin pinnacle of rock, like a church spire, the top being level with the plateau, but a great chasm gaping between. On the summit there grew one high tree. It was on that, said Professor Challenger, pointing to this tree, that the pterodactyl was perched. I climbed halfway up the rock before I shot him. Professor Summerlee seemed to show signs of a dawning credulity. Challenger saw his look of excitement and amazement. Of course, said he, Professor Summerlee will understand that when I speak of a pterodactyl, I mean a stork. Only it is the kind of stork which has no feathers, a leathery skin, membranous wings and teeth in its jaws. He grinned, reveling in his triumph. That night, we pitched our camp immediately under the cliff, a most wild and desolate spot. In the morning, after a frugal breakfast of coffee and manioc, we held a council of war. Challenger presided as if he were the Lord Chief Justice on the bench, his straw hat tilted on the back of his head, his great black beard wagging as he defined our present situation and our future movement. Beneath him you might have seen the three of us, myself, sunburnt, young, and vigorous after our open-air tramp, Summerlee, solemn, but still critical behind his eternal pipe, Lord John, as keen as a razor-edge, with his supple, alert figure leaning upon his rifle, and his eagle eyes fixed eagerly upon the speaker. Behind us were grouped the two swarthy half-breeds and the little knot of Indians, while in front and above us towered those huge, ruddy ribs of rocks which kept us from our goal. Our leader spoke. On my last visit, I exhausted every means of climbing the cliff, and where I failed, I do not think anyone else is likely to succeed, for I am something of a mountaineer. I can claim that I have surveyed about six miles of the cliff to the east of us, finding no possible way up. What shall we do now? There seems to be only one reasonable course, said Professor Summerlee. We should travel along the base of the cliff to the west and seek a practicable point for our ascent. That's it, said Lord John. If we travel round the plateau, the odds are that we shall find an easy way up. If there were an easy way up, said Challenger, then the summit would not be isolated. Yet I admit that there may be places where an expert climber may reach the summit, and yet a heavy and cumbrous animal be unable to descend. After all, my predecessor, the American Maple White, actually made such an ascent. How otherwise could he have seen the monster which he sketched in his notebook? There you reason ahead of the proved facts, said the stubborn Summerlee. I admit your plateau because I have seen it, but I am not satisfied that it contains any form of life. Challenger glanced up at the plateau and then to our amazement, seized Summerlee by the neck and tilted his face into the air. Now, sir, he shouted, do I help you to realize that the plateau contains some animal life? A thick fringe of green overhung the edge of the cliff. Out of this there had emerged a black, glistening object. As it came slowly forth, we saw that it was a very large snake with a flat head. It quivered above us for a minute, then disappeared. 
Summerlee came back to his dignity. Professor Challenger, said he, even the appearance of a very ordinary rock python does not seem to justify your seizing me by the chin. But there is life on the plateau all the same, his colleague replied in triumph. And now we had better break up our camp and travel westward until we find some means of ascent. The ground at the foot of the cliff was rocky and broken, and the going slow and difficult. Suddenly we came upon an old encampment with a quantity of travellers' debris. Must be maple whites, said Challenger. I say, look at this, said Lord John. A slip of hardwood, pointing westward, had been nailed to a great tree fern. Most certainly a signpost, said Challenger. Finding himself upon a dangerous errand, a pioneer has left a sign of the way he has taken. We may come upon other indications as we proceed. We did indeed, but they were of a terrible and most unexpected nature. We were passing along the edge of a patch of high bamboo when my eye was caught by the gleam of something white within it. Thrusting in my head between the stems, I found myself gazing at a fleshless skeleton. With a few blows from the machetes of our Indians, we cleared the spot and were able to study the details of this old tragedy. A gold watch and chain lay among the bones, and a silver cigarette case with J.C. from A.E.S. upon the lid. "'Who can he be?' asked Lord John. "'Poor devil! Every bone in his body seems to be broken.' "'And the bamboo grows through his smashed ribs,' said Summerley. "'But surely the body could not have been here while the canes grew to be twenty feet in length?' "'As to the man's identity,' said Professor Challenger, "'I have no doubt whatever.' I instituted very particular inquiries about Maple White at Rosario. He passed there four years ago, and he was not alone at the time. There was a friend, an American named James Culver, with him. I think there can be no doubt that we are now looking upon the remains of this James Culver. Nor, said Lord John, is there much doubt as to how he met death. He has fallen or been chucked from the top, and so been impaled. How else could he come by his broken bones? And how could he have been stuck through by these canes with their points so high above our heads? A hush came over us as we stood round these shattered remains and realised the truth of Lord John Roxton's words. The beetling head of the cliff projected over the cane break. Undoubtedly he had fallen from above. But had he fallen? Had it been an accident? Or... Already ominous and terrible possibilities began to form round that unknown land. We moved off in silence and continued to coast round the line of cliffs, which were as even and unbroken as some of those monstrous Antarctic ice fields which I have seen depicted as stretching from horizon to horizon. We saw no rift or break. Then suddenly, in the hollow of a rock, we perceived a rough arrow drawn in chalk, Maple White again, said Professor Challenger. He had some presentiment that worthy footsteps would follow close behind. We had proceeded five miles further when again we saw a white arrow on the rocks pointing upwards. We entered a narrow gorge, and the quick eyes of Lord John fell upon what we were seeking. High above our heads was the opening of a cave. When we reached the entrance, there was marked once again the sign of the arrow. Lord John had an electric torch, and he advanced while we followed in single file. For fifty yards the cave ran almost straight, and then the incline became steeper, and we found ourselves climbing among loose rubble. Suddenly an exclamation broke from Lord John. "'It's blocked,' said he. "'The roof has fallen in.' The road by which Maple White had ascended was no longer available. Too much cast down to speak, we stumbled down the dark tunnel and made our way back. When we were some forty feet beneath the mouth of the cave, a huge rock rolled suddenly downwards and shot past us. It was the narrowest escape for one or all of us. Looking upwards, we could see no sign of movement amidst the green jungle, but there could be little doubt that the stone was aimed at us. So the incident surely pointed to malevolent humanity upon the plateau. 
That night, a great experience awaited us, and one which forever set at rest any doubt which we could have had as to the wonders so near us. What occurred was this. Lord John had shot an adjuty, which is a small pig-like animal, and half of it having been given to the Indians, we were cooking the other half upon our fire. There is a chill in the air after dark, and we had all drawn close to the blaze. The night was moonless, but there were some stars, and one could see for a little distance across the plain. Well, suddenly, out of the darkness, out of the night, there swooped something with a swish like an aeroplane. The whole group of us were covered for an instant by a canopy of leathery wings, and I had a momentary vision of a long snake-like neck, a fierce red greedy eye and a great snapping beak, filled, to my amazement, with little gleaming teeth. The next instant it was gone, and so was our dinner. A huge black shadow twenty feet across skimmed up into the air. For an instant the monster wings blotted out the stars, and then it vanished over the brow of the cliff above us. We all sat in amazed silence round the fire, like the heroes of Virgil when the harpies came down upon them. It was Summerlee who was the first to speak. Professor Challenger, said he in a solemn voice which quavered with emotion, I owe you an apology, sir. I am very much in the wrong, and I beg you will forget what is past. It was handsomely said, and the two men, for the first time, shook hands. So much we have gained by this clear vision of our first pterodactyl. It was worth a stolen supper to bring two such men together. On the sixth day we completed our circuit of the cliffs, and found ourselves back at the first camp, beside the isolated pinnacle of rock. We were a disconsolate party, for it was absolutely certain that there was no point where we could possibly hope to scale the cliff. What were we to do now? The next morning, Challenger greeted us exultantly. Eureka! he cried. The problem is solved. He pointed to the spire-like pinnacle. Our faces fell. That horrible abyss lay between us and the plateau. We can all reach the summit. Challenger assured us. Then I may be able to show you that the resources of an inventive mind are not yet exhausted. After breakfast, we scrambled up the jagged wall and found ourselves on the small grassy platform which formed the summit. The first impression was of the extraordinary view over the whole Brazilian plain beneath us, ending in dim blue mists upon the farthest skyline. Professor Summerlee was examining with great interest the tree on the summit. Why, I cried, it's a beech. Exactly, said Challenger, and this beech tree will be our saviour. By George, cried Lord John, a bridge. It was certainly a brilliant idea of Challenger's. The tree was a good sixty feet in height, and if it only fell the right way, it would cross the chasm. Challenger handed the axe to me, and under his direction I cut gashes in the side to ensure that it should fall as we desired. Then Lord John and I set to work in earnest on the trunk. In little over an hour there was a loud crack and the tree crashed over, burying its branches among the bushes on the other side. The severed trunk rolled to the very edge of our platform, but it balanced itself a few inches from the edge, and there was our bridge to the unknown. All of us, without a word, shook hands with Professor Challenger, who bowed deeply in return. Lord John and I went down to fetch the rifles. The climb was simpler now that a rope dangled down the face of the worst part of the ascent, and the two half-breeds carried up a bale of provisions and bandoliers of cartridges. Seating himself with a leg overhanging on each side of the abyss, Challenger hopped his way across the trunk and was soon at the other side. At last, he cried, at last. Summerlee was the second, and he insisted on having two rifles slung across his back. I came next, trying hard not to look down into the horrible gulf, and then Lord John actually walked across without support. 
He must have nerves of steel. And there we were, the four of us, upon the lost world of Maple White. It seemed the moment of our supreme triumph. Who could have guessed it was the prelude to our supreme disaster? We were about fifty yards away from the edge when there came a frightful rending crash from behind us. We rushed back to find the bridge was gone. At the base of the cliff we saw a tangled mass of branches and splintered trunk. It was our beech tree. Then, on the rocky pinnacle, we saw Gomez, the half-breed, his face convulsed with hatred. Oh, John Rockstan! he shouted. There you are, and there you will remain. You are trapped, every one of you. We were too astounded to speak. A great broken bough on the grass showed whence he had gained his leverage to tilt over our bridge. We nearly killed you with a stone at the cave, he cried. But this is better. It is slower and more terrible. Your bones will whiten up there, and none will know where you lie. As you are dying, Lord Roxton, think of my brother Lopez, whom you shot five years ago. Now his memory has been avenged. Had the half-breed simply wrought his vengeance and then escaped, all might have been well with him. But Roxton was not one who could be safely taunted. There was a single crack of his rifle, a scream from the half-breed, followed by the thud of his falling body. Some little time later, a singular scene on the plain below arrested our attention. The surviving half-breed was running as one does when death is the pacemaker. Behind him bounded the huge figure of Zambo, our negro. Even as we looked, he sprang upon the fugitive, and they rolled on the ground together. An instant afterwards, Zambo rose, and waving his hand, joyously came running in our direction. The other figure lay motionless. Presently, Zambo emerged upon the top of the pinnacle. What do I do now? he cried. You tell me, and I do it. Under our directions, he undid the rope from the tree stump and threw it across to us. It was not thick enough for us to make a bridge out of it, but we were able to drag across supplies, ammunition, and other things which the faithful Zambo carried up. He was our one trusty link with the outside world. I not leave you, he cried. Whatever come, you always find me here. But our position is hopeless. Hopeless. The next day, Zambo appeared on the pinnacle with tins of cocoa and biscuits, which he threw across to us. Most important, we had four rifles and 1,300 rounds, as well as a shotgun. We had provisions to last for a few weeks, and some scientific instruments. All these things we collected together in a clearing, and as a first precaution cut down a number of thorny bushes, which we piled round in a circle. This was to be our headquarters for the time. Fort Challenger, we called it. The plateau itself, on Challenger's insistence, was named Maple White Land. We knew that the place was inhabited by unknown creatures, and that there might also prove to be human occupants. Our situation, stranded without possibility of escape, was clearly full of danger. Slowly and cautiously we set forth into the unknown, following the course of the little stream which flowed from our spring. Hardly had we started when we came across signs that there were indeed wonders awaiting us. Summerlee recognized many trees which have long passed away in the world below. We entered a region where the stream widened out and formed a considerable bog. Suddenly Lord John halted. Look at this, said he. By George, this must be the trail of the father of all birds. An enormous three-toed track was imprinted in the soft mud. We all stopped to examine that monstrous spoor. But what do you make of this? cried Professor Summerlee, pointing to what looked like the huge print of a five-fingered human hand appearing among the three-toed marks. It is a creature walking erect upon three-toed feet, and occasionally putting one of its five-fingered forepaws on the ground, announced Professor Challenger. Not a bird, my dear Roxton, no. 
a reptile, a dinosaur. Following the tracks, we pass through a screen of brushwood, and there, in an open glade, were five of the most extraordinary creatures I have ever seen. They had slate-coloured skin, scaled like a lizard's, and all five were sitting up, balancing themselves on their broad, powerful tails and their huge, three-toed hind feet. While with their five-fingered front feet, they pulled down the branches on which they browsed. I looked at my comrades. Lord John had his finger on the trigger of his elephant gun. The two professors were in silent ecstasy. In their excitement, they had unconsciously seized each other by the hand and stood like two children in the presence of a marvel. Put this down in your diary, Malone, said Challenger, and send it to your rag. August the 28th, the day we saw five live iguanodons in a glade of maple white land. The south of England was alive with them when there was plenty of good lush green stuff to keep them going. Conditions changed and the beasts died. Here, conditions have not changed and the beasts have lived. It was on this, our very first morning in the new country, that we were destined to find out what strange hazards lay around us. If the glade of the Iguanodons will remain with us as a dream, then surely the swamp of the pterodactyls will forever be our nightmare. We had travelled two or three miles when we came upon an opening in the trees, leading to a tangle of rocks. At the same time we became aware of a strange, low, gabbling and whistling sound. Lord John made his way swiftly to the line of rocks, and stood staring in amazement. Finally he waved us to come on, and we found ourselves gazing into a pit which may have been one of the smaller volcanic blowholes of the plateau. At the bottom were pools of green-scummed, stagnant water. It was a weird place in itself, but its occupants made it seem like a scene from the Seven Circles of Dante. The place was a rookery of pterodactyls. There were hundreds of the hideous creatures congregated within view. From this crawling, flapping mass of obscene reptilian life, came the clamour which filled the air, and the horrible, musty odour which turned us sick. The mothers brooded upon their leathery, yellowish eggs, while above, each upon its own stone, the horrible males sat motionless, tall, grey and withered, their huge, membranous wings closed like shawls, and their ferocious heads protruding above them. Large and small, no fewer than a thousand of these filthy creatures lay in the hollow before us. Our professors would gladly have stayed there all day, so entranced were they by this opportunity of studying the life of a prehistoric age. Finally, Challenger, bent upon proving some point Summerlee had disputed, thrust his head over the rock and nearly brought destruction upon us all. In an instant, the nearest male gave a shrill, whistling cry and flapped its twenty-foot span of leathery wings as it soared into the air. Then at least a hundred creatures rose, flew round in a huge ring, and then swooped like swallows until they were whizzing round and round us. "'Make for the wood and keep together,' cried Lord John. "'The brutes mean mischief.' As we attempted to retreat, a long neck shot out and a fierce beak made a thrust at us. Summerlee gave a cry and put a hand to his face, from which blood was streaming. Another and another followed. I felt a prod at the back of my neck, and turned dizzy with the shock. Challenger fell, and as I stooped to pick him up, I was again struck from behind. At the same instant I heard the crash of Lord John's elephant gun, and I saw one of the creatures with a broken wing struggling on the ground, spitting and gurgling at us with bloodshot, goggled eyes. Its comrades had flown higher at the sudden sound, and were circling above our heads. "'Now!' cried Lord John. "'Now for our lives!' We staggered through the brushwood, and even as we reached the trees, the harpies were on us again. Once among the trunks, we were safe, for those huge wings had no space for their sweep beneath the branches. As we reached the thicker woods, they gave up the chase, and we saw them no more. A most interesting experience, said Challenger, as we halted beside the brook, and he bathed a swollen knee. We are exceptionally well informed, Summerlee, as to the habits of the enraged pterodactyl. When we at last reached our glade and saw the thorny barricade of our camp, we thought that our adventures were at an end. 
but a fresh surprise was in store for us. Fort Challenger had been visited by some strange and powerful creature in our absence. Our stores had been strewn all over the ground, a tin of meat had been crushed to extract the contents, and a case of cartridges shattered into matchwood. We gazed with frightened eyes at the dark shadows which lay around us, and in which some fearsome shape might be lurking. How good it was when we were hailed by the voice of Zambo, and we saw him sitting and grinning from the top of the opposite pinnacle. "'All well, Massa Challenger! All well!' he cried. "'Me stay here! No fear! You always find me when you want!' His honest black face and the immense view before us helped us to remember that we really were upon this earth in the twentieth century and had not by some magic been conveyed to some raw planet in its earliest and wildest state. Marooned among the creatures of a bygone age, we gazed towards the far horizon and yearned for all that it meant. On the morning after our first adventure on the plateau, both Summerley and I were in great pain and fever, while Challenger's knee was so bruised he could hardly limp. We kept to our camp all day, and I was haunted by the feeling that we were closely observed, that something malevolent was at our very elbow. That night we were all sleeping round our dying fire, when we were aroused by a succession of the most frightful cries and screams to which I have ever listened. They seemed to come from a spot within a few hundred yards of our camp. For three or four minutes on end the fearsome cries continued, and then there was another sound, a low, deep-chested laugh, a growling, throaty gurgle of merriment. Then silence. "'What was it?' I whispered. We have been privileged to overhear a prehistoric tragedy, said Challenger solemnly. The sort of drama which occurred in some Jurassic lagoon, when the greater dragon pinned the lesser among the slime. It was surely well for man that he came late in the order of creation. There were powers abroad in earlier days which no courage and no mechanism of his could have met. Summerlee raised his hand. I hear something. From the utter silence there emerged a deep, regular pat-pat, the tread of some animal. It halted near our gateway, and we heard the low breathing of the creature. I cocked my rifle. Don't fire, whispered Lord John. I think I can see it. Perhaps I can make something of the fellow. It was as brave an act as ever I saw a man do. He stooped to the fire, picked up a blazing branch, and slipped in an instant through a sally port which he had made in our gateway. The thing moved forward with a dreadful snarl. Lord John never hesitated, but running towards it with a quick, light step, he dashed the flaming wood into the brute's face. For one moment I had a vision of a horrible mask like a giant toad's, of a warty, leprous skin and of a loose mouth all beslobbered with fresh blood. The next, there was a crash in the underwood, and our dreadful visitor was gone. "'I thought he wouldn't face the fire,' said Lord John, laughing, as he came back and threw his branch among the faggots. In the morning we discovered the source of the hideous uproar which had aroused us in the night. The Iguanodon Glade was the scene of a horrible butchery. There were pools of blood and enormous lumps of flesh scattered in every direction over the greensward. We discovered that all this carnage came from just one of these unwieldy monsters, which had been literally torn to pieces by some creature far more ferocious than itself. From the marks of the teeth and claws, said Professor Challenger, I should pronounce for Allosaurus. Or Megalosaurus, said Summerlee. Exactly, said Challenger. Any one of the larger carnivorous dinosaurs would meet the case. But there is a more important question. We know roughly that this plateau is not larger than an average English county. Within this confined space, one would have expected that the carnivorous creatures, multiplying unchecked, would have eventually exhausted their food supply and have been compelled either to modify their flesh-eating habits or die of hunger. This, we see, has not been so. 
We can only imagine, therefore, that the balance of nature is preserved by some check which limits the numbers of these ferocious creatures. One of the many interesting problems which await our solution is to discover what that check may be and how it operates. That morning we mapped out a small portion of the plateau, avoiding the swamp of the pterodactyls and keeping to the east of our brook, where the country was still thickly wooded. I have dwelt up to now upon the terrors of Maple White Land, but there was another side to the subject. For all that morning we wandered among lovely flowers, mostly, as I observed, white or yellow in colour, these being, as our professor explained, the primitive flower shades. In many places the ground was absolutely covered with them, and as we walked ankle-deep on that wonderful yielding carpet, the scent was almost intoxicating in its sweetness and intensity. The homely English bee buzzed everywhere around us. Many of the trees under which we passed had their branches bowed down with fruit, some of which were of familiar sorts, while other varieties were new. By observing which of them were pecked by the birds, we avoided all danger of poison and added a delicious variety to our food reserve. We returned to our camp with some misgiving, but on this occasion we found everything in order. That evening we had a grand discussion upon our present situation and future plans. Summerlee opened the debate. What we ought to be doing today, tomorrow and all the time is finding some way out of the trap into which we have fallen. I must say, said Lord John, that I think it would be a mighty poor thing to go back to London before I know a great deal more of this place than I do at present. I could never dare to walk into the office of my paper, said I, leaving such unexhausted copy behind me. Besides, we can't get down even if we wanted. The problem of descent is at first sight a formidable one, said Professor Challenger, yet I cannot doubt that the intellect can solve it. The question of our return will soon have to be faced. I absolutely refuse to leave, however, until we have made a superficial examination of this country and are able to take back with us something in the nature of a chart. Professor Summerlee gave a snort of impatience. We have spent two long days in exploration, said he, and we are no wiser as to the actual geography of the place than when we started. It is clear that it is all thickly wooded, and it would take months to penetrate it and to learn the relations of one part to another. If there were some central peak, it would be different, but it all slopes downwards. So far as we can see, the farther we go, the less likely it is that we will get any general view. It was at that moment that I had my inspiration. My eyes chanced to light upon the enormous gnarled trunk of the ginkgo tree which cast its huge branches over us. Surely, if its bowl exceeded that of all others, its height must do the same. If the rim of the plateau was indeed the highest point, then why should this mighty tree not prove to be a watchtower which commanded the whole country? Now, ever since I ran wild as a lad in Ireland, I have been a bold and skilled tree climber. My comrades might be my masters on the rocks, but I knew that I would be supreme among those branches. Could I only get my legs onto the lowest of the giant offshoots, then it would be strange indeed if I could not make my way to the top. My comrades were delighted at my idea. I clambered upwards through the dense foliage with such speed that I soon lost sight of the ground, and the booming of Challenger's voice seemed to be a great distance beneath me. There was a thick, bush-like clump upon a branch up which I was swarming, and I leaned my head round it in order to see what was beyond. I nearly fell out of the tree in my surprise and horror at what I saw. A face was gazing into mine, at the distance of only a foot or two. It was a human face, or at least it was far more human than any monkeys that I have ever seen. It was long and whitish, with a flattened nose, and the lower jaw projecting with curved, sharp canine teeth. For an instant I read hatred and menace in its evil eyes. Then came an expression of fear. There was a crash of broken boughs as it dived wildly into the tangle of green. I caught a glimpse of a hairy body like that of a reddish pig, and then it was gone. I was so shocked at the sudden appearance of this ape-man that I wondered whether I should climb down again. But I was already so far up the great tree that it seemed a humiliation to return without having carried out my mission. 
After a long pause, therefore, to recover my breath and my courage, I continued my ascent to the very highest point, where I settled into a convenient fork and looked down at a wonderful panorama of the country in which we found ourselves. The sun was just above the western skyline, and the evening was a particularly bright and clear one, so that the whole extent of the plateau was visible beneath me. It was, as seen from this height, of an oval contour, with a breadth of about thirty miles and a width of twenty. Its general shape was that of a shallow funnel, all the sides sloping down to a considerable lake in the centre. This lake may have been ten miles in circumference, and lay very green and beautiful in the evening light, with a thick fringe of reeds at its edges, and with its surface broken by several yellow sandbanks, which gleamed golden in the mellow sunshine. A number of long, dark objects, which were too large for alligators and too long for canoes, lay from the edges of these patches of sand. With my glass I could clearly see that they were alive, but what their nature might be I could not imagine. From the side of the plateau on which we were, slopes of woodland with occasional glades stretched down for five or six miles to the central lake. I could see at my very feet the glade of the iguanodons, and farther off was a round opening in the trees which marked the swamp of the pterodactyls. On the side facing me, however, the plateau presented a very different aspect. There, the basalt cliffs of the outside were reproduced upon the inside, forming an escarpment about two hundred feet high with a woody slope beneath it. Along the base of these red cliffs, some distance above the ground, I could see a number of dark holes through the glass, which I conjectured to be the mouths of caves. At the opening of one of these, something white was shimmering, but I was unable to make out what it was. I sat charting the country until the sun had set, and it was so dark that I could no longer distinguish details. Then I climbed down to my companions, waiting for me so eagerly at the bottom of the great tree. For once, I was the hero of the expedition. Alone I had thought of it, and alone I had done it. And here was the chart which would save us a month's blind groping among unknown dangers. I told them of my encounter with the ape-man among the branches. He has been there all the time, said I. How do you know? asked Lord John. Because I have never been without that feeling that something malevolent was watching us, I replied. That evening, by the light of the fire and of a single candle, the first map of the lost world was elaborated. Every detail which I had noted from my watchtower was drawn out in its relative place. Challenger's pencil hovered over the great blank which marked the lake. What shall we call it? he asked. It's up to you, young fellow, said Lord John. You saw it first. Then, said I, blushing as I said it, let it be named Lake Gladys. Challenger looked at me sympathetically and shook his great head in mock disapproval. Boys will be boys, said he. Lake Gladys, let it be. I glowed with pride when three such men as my comrades thanked me for having saved, or at least greatly helped, the situation. Now I was coming into my own. Alas, for the pride that goes before a fall. Sleep seemed to be impossible for me that night, excited as I was by the adventure of the tree. The full moon was shining brightly, and the air was crisply cold. What a night for a walk! And then suddenly came the thought, why not? Suppose I stole softly away. Suppose I made my way down to the lake. Suppose I was back at breakfast with some record of the place. Would I not be thought an even more worthy associate? I seemed to hear Gladys's voice saying, there are heroisms all around us. I clutched at a gun. My pockets were full of cartridges and quickly slipped out, past the unconscious summerly, most futile of sentinels, I had not gone far before I deeply repented my rashness. It was dreadful in the forest. I thought of the nameless and horrible monster I had glimpsed in the light of Lord John's torch. At any instant it might spring upon me from the shadows. As I touched the lever of my gun, my heart leaped within me. It was the shotgun, not the rifle I had taken. The impulse to return swept over me, but again... 
The foolish pride fought against the idea of failure. After a little hesitation, then, I screwed up my courage and continued on my way, my useless gun under my arm. It was a fearsome walk, and one that will be with me so long as memory holds. I followed the gurgling brook, which was my guide. In the great moonlit clearings I slunk along among the shadows on the margin, but always within earshot of the tinkle and splash of the running water. I passed close to the pterodactyl swamp, and as I did so, one of those great creatures soared into the air. As it passed across the face of the moon, the light shone clearly through the membranous wings, and it looked like a flying skeleton against the white tropical radiance. Not until it had settled again did I dare to steal onwards on my journey. At last, my watch showed that it was one in the morning, I saw the gleam of water amid the openings of the jungle, and ten minutes later I had climbed onto a huge isolated block of lava close to the water's edge. Lying on the top, I had an excellent view in every direction. From the summit of the great tree I had seen on the farther cliff a number of dark spots, which appeared to be the mouths of caves. Now, as I looked up at the same cliffs, I saw discs of light, like the portholes of a liner in the darkness. These glowing spots must be the reflection of fires within the caves, fires which could only be lit by the hand of man. There were human beings, then, on the plateau. Here was news indeed for us to bear back to London. My attention was soon drawn away from these distant sights and brought back to what was going on at my very feet. Down the path to the drinking place was coming a most monstrous animal. For a moment I wondered where I could have seen that ungainly shape, that arched back with triangular fringes along it, that strange bird-like head held close to the ground, then it came back to me. It was the Stegosaurus, the very creature which Maple White had preserved in his sketchbook. The ground shook beneath his tremendous weight, and his gulpings of water resounded through the still night. Then he lumbered away and was lost among the boulders. Looking at my watch, I saw that it was half-past two o'clock, and high time, therefore, that I started on my homeward journey. I set off in high spirits, following the little brook, and feeling that I had done good work, and was bringing back a fine budget of news for my companions. I was about halfway home, and plodding up the slope, when I heard a strange noise behind me, something between a snore and a growl, low, deep, and exceedingly menacing. I hastened more rapidly upon my way, but half a mile or so further on the sound was repeated, but now louder and more menacing than before. My heart stood still within me. Some strange beast was on my trail, and closing in upon me every minute. Then suddenly I saw it as it hopped out into the moonlight. I say hopped, for the beast moved like an enormous kangaroo. He had a broad, squat, toad-like face, just like that which had alarmed us in our camp, and I was sure that this was one of the great flesh-eating dinosaurs, the most terrible beasts which have ever walked this earth. I was a fast runner and in excellent condition. Flinging away my useless gun, I fled. With that horror behind me, I ran and ran and ran. The thudding of giant feet and the thick, gasping breath of the creature came nearer and nearer. Every instant I expected to feel his grip upon my back, and then, suddenly, there came a crash. I was falling through space, and everything beyond was darkness and rest. As I emerged from unconsciousness, I could make out a circle of starlit sky above me, I was lying at the bottom of a deep pit. There was no sign of the monster, nor could I hear any sound from above. Suddenly I remembered that I had a tin box of wax vestas in my pocket. Striking one of them, I was able to see what was the place into which I had fallen. It was a trap, made by the hand of man. A post in the centre, some nine feet long, and sharpened at the upper end, was black with the stale blood of the creatures who had been impaled upon it. Now it was clear that the natives had refuges in their narrow-mouthed caves, which the huge creatures could not penetrate, and that they were capable of setting such traps as would destroy the animals. Man was always the master. 
The sloping wall of the pit was not difficult for an active man to climb, and when I clambered out there was no sign of my enemy. Reassured by the absolute stillness and the growing light, I stole back along the path by which I had come, picked up my gun, and shortly afterwards struck the brook which was my guide home. Suddenly there came something to remind me of my absent companions. In the clear, still morning air there sounded far away a single rifle shot. No doubt they imagined that I was lost in the woods and had fired this shot to guide me home. I hurried on as fast as possible, and when I reached the last belt of trees which separated me from Fort Challenger, I raised my voice in a cheery shout. No answering greeting came back, and my heart sank at the ominous stillness. The gate was open, and I rushed in. A fearful sight met my eyes. Our effects were scattered in wild confusion over the ground. My comrades had disappeared, and, close to the smouldering ashes of our fire, the grass was stained crimson with a hideous pool of blood. The horrible thought came to me that I might never see my companions again, that I might find myself abandoned all alone in that dreadful place. For a time I must have nearly lost my reason, until a thought came to me and brought some comfort to my heart. I was not absolutely alone in the world. Down at the bottom of the cliff, and within call, was waiting the faithful Zambo. I went to the edge of the plateau and looked over. Sure enough, he was squatting beside his fire, with one of our Indians seated beside him. I shouted loudly, and Zambo looked up, waved his hand, and began to ascend the pinnacle. Soon he was listening with deep distress to the story which I told him. "'Devil's got them for sure, Mazza Malone, said he. "'You come down quick, else he get you as well.' "'How can I come down, Zambo?' "'Send Indian to village, sir. "'Plenty hide rope in Indian village. "'He down below, ready to take letter, bring rope, anything.' "'To take a letter? Why not? "'He might bring help. "'In any case, he would ensure that news should reach our friends at home.' I had two completed letters already waiting, and I spent the day in writing a third, which would bring my experiences up to date. I also drew up a note, to be given to any merchant or sea captain the Indian could find, imploring them to see that ropes were sent to us. These documents I threw to Zambo when he came up in the evening, and also my purse, with three English sovereigns for the Indian. He was promised twice as much if he returned with the ropes. Just as the sun was setting upon that melancholy night, I saw the lonely figure of the Indian upon the vast plain beneath me, and I watched him, our one faint hope of salvation, until he disappeared in the rising mists of evening which lay, rose-tinted from the setting sun, between the far-off river and me. It was quite dark when I at last turned back to our stricken camp, and my last vision as I went was the red gleam of Zambo's fire, the one point of light in the wide world below, as was his faithful presence in my own shadowed soul. I lit three separate fires in a triangle, and having eaten a hearty supper, dropped off into a profound sleep, from which I had a strange and most welcome awakening. Just as day was breaking, a hand was laid upon my arm. Starting up, I saw Lord John kneeling beside me, he was pale and wide-eyed, gasping like one who has run far and fast. His gaunt face was scratched and bloody, his clothes hanging in rags. Quick! Young fellow, quick! he cried. Every moment counts. Get the rifles and cartridges. Now, some food. Get a move on, or we are done. Still half awake, I hurried after him through the wood until we came to a dense clump of brushwood. I think we are safe here, he panted, pulling me down by his side. What is it all about? I asked when I had got my breath. The ape men, he cried. My God, what brutes! It was in the early morning. Suddenly it rained apes. They came down thick as apples out of a tree. I shot one of them, but before we knew where we were, they had a spread eagle on our backs. I called them apes, but they carried sticks and stones in their hands and jabbered talked to each other and tied our hands with creepers. Ape men, that's what they are. Missing links, and I wish they had stayed missing. I thought it was the end of us. And Challenger managed to struggle to his feet and yelled at them to get it over with. Well, they all jabbered together, and then one of them, the old ape-man, who was their chief, 
stood beside Challenger. You all smile, but they could have been kinsmen. They had the same short body, round chest, beard, and eyebrows. And when the ape man put his paw on Challenger's shoulder, the thing was complete. Summerlee was hysterical and laughed till he cried. The ape men cackled too, and then they dragged us off through the forest. Challenger was all right. Four of them carried him shoulder high, and he went like a Roman emperor. Well, they got us to this town of theirs, about a thousand huts of branches and leaves, three or four miles from here, and tied us up. Old Challenger was up a tree eating pines and having the time of his life, but he did get some fruit to us and loosened our bonds. It was a mighty consolation to us to know that you were running loose, but where have you been? In a few sentences I told him what had happened to me. And now, young fellow, Lord John said, I'll tell you what will surprise you. You say you saw signs of men. Well, we have seen the natives themselves. It seems that the humans hold one side of the plateau over yonder where you saw the caves, and the ape men hold this side, and there is bloody war between them all the time. Yesterday, the ape men brought in half a dozen of the humans as prisoners. They had been bitten and clawed so that they could scarcely walk, and the ape men put two of them to death then and then, fairly pulling the arm off one of them. It was perfectly beastly. Just under Ape Town is the jumping off place of the prisoners. They have a sort of clear parade ground on the top, and one by one the poor devils have to jump. Down below is that bristle of sharp canes where we found the skeleton of the American, you remember? They took us out to see the ceremony, and the whole tribe lined up on the edge. Four of the Indians jumped, and the canes went through them like knitting needles through a pat of butter. It was horrible. Well, I fancied that we were to be the star performers in the show today, so I thought it was time I made a break for it. It was all on me, for Summerlee was useless and Challenger not much better. One thing is, these brutes have short bandy legs, and they can't run as fast as a man in the open. Another point was that they knew nothing about guns. I don't believe they even understood how the fellow I shot came by his hurt. If we could get at our guns, there was no saying what we could do. So I broke away early this morning and gave my guard a kick in the tummy that led him out and sprinted for the camp. There I got you and the guns, and here we are. But the professors, I cried in consternation. Well, we must just go back and fetch them. I couldn't bring them with me. Challenger was up the tree, and Summerlee was not fit for the effort. The only chance was to get the guns and try a rescue. So after making sure of our breakfast and stuffing our pockets with cartridges, we started off upon our mission of rescue, a rifle in each hand. The woods seemed to be full of ape men. Again and again we heard their curious clicking chatter. Our advance, therefore, was very slow, and two hours must have passed before I saw by Lord John's cautious movements that we were near our destination. We crawled forward and looked through the bushes at a clearing which stretched before us. It was a sight which I shall never forget until my dying day. So weird, so impossible. A rookery, with every nest a little house, would best convey the idea. The openings of these huts and the branches of the trees were thronged with a dense mob of ape people, whom from their size I took to be the females and infants of the tribe. Near the edge of the cliff there had assembled some hundred shaggy creatures of immense size, all horrible to look upon. In front of them stood a small group of Indians, and beside them, his head bowed in dejection, Professor Summerlee. Away from the others were two figures, our comrade, Professor Challenger, and his master, the King of the Ape Men, who was, as Lord John had said, the very image of our professor, except that his colouring was red instead of black. An active drama was in progress. Two of the ape men had seized one of the Indians and dragged him to the edge of the cliff. The king raised his hand as a signal, and they heaved the poor wretch over the precipice. The whole assembly gave a mad yell of delight and waited for the next victim. This time it was Summerlee. Two guards pulled him brutally to the front. Challenger had turned to the king, pleading, imploring for his friend's life. The ape man pushed him roughly aside and shook his head. It was the last conscious movement he was to make upon earth. Lord John's rifle cracked, and the king sank down, a tangled red, sprawling thing, upon the ground. "'Shoot into the thick of them!' cried my companion. "'Shoot, Sonny! Shoot!' With our four guns, the two of us made havoc. The dense mob of ape-men ran about in bewilderment, and then rushed to the trees for shelter. 
Challenger seized Summerlee by the arm, and they both ran towards us, followed by the four surviving Indians, trembling with fear and imploring our protection. Lord John covered our retreat, and the chattering brutes soon slackened their pursuit in face of that unerring rifle. At last we reached our camp and closed the thornbush door. We all awoke the next morning, exhausted after the terrific emotions and scanty food of the previous day. There was no sound in the woods, but we should have been warned by our first experience how cunningly and how patiently these creatures can watch and wait until their chance comes. A council was held, and it was agreed that we should make our way to the caves where the Indians lived, relying upon the good word of those we had rescued to ensure a warm welcome from their fellows. We were now able to take a good look at the Indians. They were small men, wiry and well-built. Their speech, though unintelligible to us, was fluent among themselves, and as they pointed to each other and uttered the word Akala many times over, we gathered that this was the name of their nation. The youngest, with his head shaven in front, seemed to be the chief among them. When Challenger touched him, he started like a spurred horse. Then, holding himself with great dignity, he uttered the word Maretas several times. Whatever fate may be mine through life, I am very sure that I shall never be nearer death than I was that morning. One of the Indians had gone to fetch water from the brook, and after he had been away for quite a time, I picked up my rifle and went to look for him. As I made my way through the brushwood towards the brook, I noticed something red huddled among the bushes. I gave a cry to warn my friends that something was amiss, and then, running forward, I stooped over what I now saw to be the body of the missing Indian. Suddenly a rustle of leaves made me look upwards. Out of the thick green foliage which hung over my head, two long muscular arms covered with reddish hair were descending. I sprang backwards, but quick as I was, those hands were quicker still. They missed a fatal grip on my throat, but one caught the back of my neck and the other one my face. I was lifted from the ground, and I felt an intolerable pressure forcing my head back and back. My senses swam, and I began to grow limp in the creature's grasp. Dully and far off I heard the crack of a rifle, and was feebly aware of dropping to the earth. I awoke to find myself on my back, with Challenger and Summerlee propping me up and Lord John sprinkling my head with water. Concern was in all their faces. "'You've had the escape of your life, young fella said Lord John. I missed the beast in my flurry, but he dropped you all right and was off like a streak. By George, I wish I had fifty men with rifles. I'd clear out the whole gang of them. It was clear now that the sooner we got away from their neighbourhood, the better. For fear of ambush, we took the route I had followed in my solitary journey to the lake, where there were only scattered trees and low scrub. Our great regret was that we were losing touch with Zambo, our link with the outside world. However, we had a fair supply of cartridges for our guns, so at least we could look after ourselves. Zambo had faithfully promised to stay where he was. It was in the early afternoon that we started upon our journey, with the young chief walking at our head as guide. As we left, we heard a sudden great cry from the ape men in the woods behind us, but there was no sign of pursuit. In the later afternoon we reached the margin of the lake, where a wonderful sight lay before us. Sweeping over the glassy surface was a great flotilla of canoes coming straight for the shore. They beached their boats upon the sloping sand and prostrated themselves with loud cries of greeting before the young chief. Finally, an elderly man ran forward and embraced most tenderly the youth whom we had saved. He then looked at us, asked some questions, and embraced us also each in turn. Then, at his order, the whole tribe lay upon the ground before us in homage. It was clear that the natives had come out upon the warpath, for each man carried a long bamboo spear, bow and arrows, and some sort of club or stone battle-axe at his side. Our young friend made a spirited harangue with such eloquent gestures that we could understand it all as clearly as if we had known his language. "'What is the use of returning?' he said. "'Sooner or later the thing must be done.' We are assembled now and ready. These strange men are our friends. 
They hate the ape men as we do. They are great fighters, and they command the thunder and lightning. Let us go forward and either die now or live forever in safety. The warriors burst into a roar of applause, waving their rude weapons in the air. The old chief stepped forward to us and asked us some question, pointing at the same time to the woods. Lord John turned to us for an answer. We all agreed, and nodding to the chief, Lord John slapped his rifle. The old fellow clasped our hands each in turn, while his men cheered louder than ever. It was too late to advance that night, so the Indians settled down into a rude bivouac. We roamed round the edge of the water, seeking to learn something more of this strange country. Challenger found a bubbling, gurgling mud geyser, where some strange gas formed great bursting bubbles on the surface. He thrust a hollow reed into it and was able, on touching it with a lighted match, to cause a sharp explosion. He inverted a leathern pouch over the end of the tube, and so filling it with gas, he was able to send it soaring up into the air. An inflammable gas, he announced, containing a considerable proportion of free hydrogen. The resources of GEC are not yet exhausted. And he swelled with some secret purpose. But nothing seemed so wonderful as the great sheet of water before us. It boiled and heaved with strange life. Great slate-coloured backs and high, serrated dorsal fins shot up with a fringe of silver. Here and there, high serpent heads projected out of the water. And when one of these creatures wriggled onto a sandbank within a few hundred yards of us, exposing a barrel-shaped body and huge flippers, Challenger and Summerley broke out into a duet of wonder and admiration. A freshwater plesiosaurus, cried Summerley, that I should have lived to see such a sight. We are blessed, my dear Challenger, above all zoologists since the world began. At earliest dawn, our camp was astir, and an hour later we started upon our memorable expedition. Our numbers had been reinforced during the night by a fresh batch of natives from the caves, and we were four or five hundred strong when we made our advance. We made our way up the long slope of the bush country until we were near the edge of the forest. A wild, shrill clamour arose from the wood, and suddenly... A body of ape-men rushed out with clubs and stones and made for the Indians. It was a valiant move, but a foolish one, for they were slow of foot, while their opponents were as agile as cats. Arrow after arrow buried itself in their hides, and of all the ape-men who had rushed out into the open, I do not think that one got back to cover. But the matter was more deadly when we came among the trees. For an hour or more after we entered the wood, there was a desperate struggle, in which for a time we hardly held our own. Eight men in the trees hurled down stones and logs of wood, then dropped bodily onto our ranks, fighting furiously until they were felled. Once our allies broke under the pressure, and had it not been for the execution done by our rifles, they would certainly have taken to their heels. But they were gallantly rallied by their old chief, and came on with such a rush that the ape men began in turn to give way. I was emptying my magazine as quick as I could fire, and on the farther flank we heard the continuous cracking of our companions' rifles. Then, in a moment, came the panic and collapse. The great creatures were driven back to their city, where a semicircle of Indian spearmen closed in on them. In a minute, it was over. Thirty or forty died where they stood. The others, screaming and clawing, were thrust over the precipice and went hurtling down, as their prisoners had of old, onto the sharp bamboos six hundred feet below. It was as Challenger had said, and the reign of man was assured forever in Maple White Land. The males were exterminated, Ape Town was destroyed, the females and young were driven away to live in bondage, and the long rivalry of untold centuries had reached its bloody end. For us, the victory brought much advantage. Once again we were able to visit our camp and get at our stores, once more, also, we were able to communicate with Zambo, who had been terrified by the spectacle from afar of an avalanche of apes falling from the edge of the cliff. 
Come away, Massas, come away, he cried, his eyes starting from his head. The devil get you sure if you stay up there. It is the voice of sanity, said Summerlee with conviction. We have had adventures enough, and they are neither suitable to our character or our position. I hold you to your word, Challenger. From now onwards you devote your energies to getting us out of this horrible country and back once more to civilization. The victory of the Indians and the annihilation of the ape-men marked the turning point of our fortunes. From then onwards we were in truth masters of the plateau, for the natives looked upon us with a mixture of fear and gratitude. But when we expressed by signs our desire to descend, they could only shake their heads and shrug their shoulders. Some day I will write a fuller account of the Akala Indians, of our life amongst them, and of the glimpses we had of the strange conditions of wondrous maple white land. When the time comes, I will describe that wondrous moonlit night upon the Great Lake, when a young Ichthyosaurus, a strange creature, half seal, half fish, with a third eye on the top of his head, nearly upset our canoe. I will tell also of the huge bird twelve feet from head to foot, that chased Challenger to the shelter of the rocks one day, where the great creature, for Arrakis its name, according to our panting professor, went down before Lord John Roxton's rifle. I will tell, too, of when the conical bullets of the twentieth century were of no avail against those frightful dinosaurs which had disturbed our camp and pursued me upon my solitary journey, and how the monsters eventually fell to the poisoned arrows of the natives. Finally, I will surely give some account of the Toxodon, the giant ten-foot guinea pig, which we killed as it drank in the grey of the morning by the side of the lake. These are the awesome and fantastic scenes which my mind and my pen will dwell upon in every detail at some future day. But one fact we had speedily discovered. The Indians would do nothing to help us devise a means of returning to the outer world. In every other way they were our friends. But our suggestions for escape were met by a good-humoured but invincible refusal. Only Maretas, the youngster whom we had saved, looked wistfully at us, grieving for our thwarted wishes. A little red-skinned wife and a cave of our own were freely offered to each of us if we would but forget our own people and dwell forever on the plateau. So far all had been kindly, but we began to fear that at the last they might try to hold us by force. Twice I went over to our old camp in order to see our negro, who still kept watch and ward below the cliff. I had one strange experience as I came away from the second visit. I saw approaching me a man walking inside a bell-shaped cage made of bent canes. As he drew nearer, I saw that it was Lord John Roxton. "'What in the world are you doing?' I asked. "'Visiting my friends, the pterodactyls,' said he. I'm going to get a young devil chick for Challenger. That's one of my jobs. No, I don't want your company. I'm safe in this cage, and you are not. So long. If Lord John's behaviour was strange at that time, that of Challenger was more so. He had been in the habit of walking off by himself every morning and returning later with looks of portentous solemnity. And one day he let us into the secret of his plans. From the dried and scraped stomach of one of the lake's great fish lizards, he had made a huge sack, sewn up at one end and with only a small orifice left at the other. Into this opening several bamboo canes had been inserted, and the other ends of the canes were in contact with conical clay funnels which collected the gas bubbling up through the mud of the geyser. A good-sized gas bag was forming, and the straining upon the cords holding it to the surrounding trees showed that it was capable of considerable lift. "'For some days,' said Challenger, "'I have exerted my whole brain force upon the problem of how we shall descend from these cliffs. There is no tunnel. We are unable to construct any kind of bridge. The idea of a balloon naturally followed. Behold the result.' "'Clever Aldea,' whispered Lord John to me delightedly. "'You don't mean us to go up in that thing, Challenger?' said Summerlee in an acid voice. "'I mean, my dear Summerlee, to give you such a demonstration of its powers that after seeing it you will, I am sure, have no hesitation in trusting yourself to it. 
Midsummer madness, snorted Summerlee. Challenger brought out a lump of basalt of considerable size and fastened it to thongs hanging from a collar which had been placed over the dome of the balloon. He attached a rope to the lump of basalt and passed the other end of it three times round his arm. I will now, said Challenger with a smile of pleased anticipation, demonstrate the carrying power of my balloon. As he said so, he cut with a knife the various lashing that held it. Never was our expedition in more imminent danger of complete annihilation. The inflated membrane shot up with frightful velocity into the air. In an instant, Challenger was pulled off his feet and dragged after it. I had just time to throw my arms round his ascending waist when I was myself whipped up into the air. Lord John had me with a rat-trap grip round the legs, but I felt that he also was coming off the ground. For a moment, I had a vision of four adventurers floating like a string of sausages over the land that they had explored. But happily there were limits to the strain which the rope would stand, though none apparently to the lifting powers of this infernal machine. There was a sharp crack, and we were in a heap upon the ground with coils of rope all over us. When we were able to stagger to our feet, we saw far off in the deep blue sky one dark spot where the lump of basalt was speeding upon its way. Splendid! cried the undaunted challenger, rubbing his injured arm. A most thorough and satisfactory demonstration. I could not have anticipated such a success. Within a week, gentlemen, I promise that a second balloon will be prepared and that you can count upon taking in safety and comfort the first stage of our homeward journey. It was on the very evening of our perilous adventure with Challenger's homemade balloon that the change came in our fortunes. I have said that the one person from whom we had some sign of sympathy in our attempt to get away was the young chief whom we had rescued. He alone had no desire to hold us against our will in a strange land. He had told us as much by his expressive language of signs. That evening, after dusk, he came down to our little camp, handed me, for some reason he had always shown his attentions to me, perhaps because I was the one who was nearest his age, a small roll of the bark of a tree, and then pointing solemnly up at the row of caves above him, he had put his finger to his lips as a sign of secrecy and had stolen back again to his people. I took the slip of bark back to the firelight and we examined it together. On the inner side there was a singular arrangement of lines, neatly done in charcoal on the white surface, with a cross below one of the lines. Lord John craned his neck to have a look at it. By George, he cried, I believe I've got it. How many marks are there on that paper? Eighteen. Well, there are eighteen cave openings on the hillside above us. This is a chart of the caves, and the cross marks one that is much deeper than the others. One that goes through, I cried. I believe our young friend has read the riddle, said Challenger. There is a dry, bituminous wood upon the plateau used by the Indians for torches. Each of us picked up a faggot of this and made our way up weed-covered steps to the particular cave marked in the drawing. A great number of enormous bats flapped round our heads as we advanced into it. As we had no desire to draw the attention of the Indians to our proceedings, we stumbled along in the dark until we had penetrated a considerable distance into the cavern. Then, at last, we lit our torches. It was a beautiful dry tunnel with smooth grey walls covered with native symbols, a curved roof which arched over our heads and white glistening sand beneath our feet. We hurried eagerly along it until, with a deep groan of bitter disappointment, we were brought to a halt. A sheer wall of rock had appeared before us with no chink through which a mouse could have slipped. There was no escape for us there. I looked at the chart again and gave a sudden cry of joy. I believe I have it. It is marked as a forked cave, and in the darkness we must have passed the fork. Follow me. It was as I had said. We had not gone thirty yards before a great black opening loomed in the wall. We turned into it to find that we were in a much larger passage than before. 
Along it, we hurried in breathless impatience for many hundreds of yards. Then, suddenly, in the black darkness of the arch in front of us, we saw a gleam of dark red light. We stared in amazement. The moon, by George! cried Lord John. We are through, boys! We are through! It was indeed the full moon which shone straight down the aperture, which opened upon the cliffs. It was a small rift, not larger than a window, but it was enough for all our purposes. As we craned our necks through it, we could see that the descent was not a very difficult one, and that the level ground was no very great way below us. It was no wonder that from below we had not observed the place, as the cliffs curved overhead, and an ascent at the spot would have seemed so impossible as to discourage close inspection. We satisfied ourselves that with the help of our rope we could find our way down, and then returned, rejoicing, to our camp to make our preparations for the next evening. What we did, we had to do quickly and secretly, since even at this last hour the Indians might hold us back. Our stores we would leave behind us, save only our guns and cartridges. But Challenger had some unwieldy stuff which he ardently desired to take with him, and one particular package, of which I may not speak, which gave us more labour than any. Slowly the day passed, but when the darkness fell we were ready for our departure. With much labour we got our things up the steps, and then, looking back, took one last long survey of that strange land, soon, I fear, to be vulgarised, the prey of hunter and prospector, but to each of us a dreamland of glamour and romance, a land where we had dared much, suffered much, and learned much. Our land, as we shall ever fondly call it. Even as we looked, a high, wickering cry, the call of some weird animal, rang clear out of the darkness. It was the very voice of Maple White Land bidding us goodbye. We turned and plunged into the cave, which led to home. Two hours later, our packages and all we owned were at the foot of the cliff. Save for Challenger's luggage, we had never a difficulty. By morning, we were at Zambo's camp to find that the rescue party had arrived, twenty Indians from the river. At least... There would be no difficulty in carrying our packages back to the Amazon. We had no notion of the uproar which the mere rumour of our experiences had caused throughout Europe. But when the Ivernia docked, we found Southampton full of pressmen. It was agreed among us, however, that no information should be given to the press until we had met the members of the Zoological Institute. This had the natural effect of focusing attention upon the meeting which was advertised for November the 7th, the second evening after our arrival. For this gathering, the Zoological Hall was found to be far too small, and it was only in the Queen's Hall in Regent Street that accommodation could be found. And so I turn to the last supreme eventful moment of our adventure. I can do no better than transcribe the full and excellent account in the issue of my own journal of the 8th of November by my friend and fellow reporter, Macdonough. Thus then, friend Mac in his report. The New World. Great meeting at the Queen's Hall. Scenes of uproar. Extraordinary incident. What was it? Nocturnal riot in Regent Street. The much-discussed meeting of the Zoological Institute convened to hear the report of the Committee of Investigation sent out last year to South America to test the assertions made by Professor Challenger as to the continued existence of prehistoric life upon that continent was held last night in the Greater Queen's Hall. The tickets were confined to members and their friends, but the general public, entertaining a grievance at having been excluded, stormed the doors. Several people were injured in the prolonged melee, including Inspector Scoble of H Division, whose leg was unfortunately broken. The entrance of the four heroes of the occasion was the signal for a remarkable demonstration of welcome. Though an acute observer might have detected some signs of dissent amidst the applause. The travellers took their places in the front of a platform which already contained all the leading scientific men, not only of this country, but of France, Germany and Sweden. 
The spokesman of the committee, Professor Summerlee, rose to another extraordinary outbreak of enthusiasm. Having described the genesis of their journey and paid a handsome tribute to his friend, Professor Challenger, coupled with an apology for the incredulity with which his assertions, now fully vindicated, had been received, Professor Summerlee then gave an account of their journey and the difficulties encountered by the expedition. Having conducted his audience in fancy to the summit, and marooned them there by reason of the fall of their bridge, uh, the professor proceeded to describe both the horrors and attractions of that remarkable land. He laid stress upon the rich harvest reaped by science in the observations of the wonderful beast, bird, insect, and plant life of the plateau. He and his companions had seen at least a dozen creatures, most of them at a distance, corresponding with nothing at present known to science. The plateau was very rich in known prehistoric forms, dating back in some cases to early Jurassic times. He then thrilled the assembly with an account of the terrible carnivorous dinosaurs, which had on more than one occasion pursued members of the party. He mentioned the gigantic and grotesque Stegosaurus, drawn in the sketchbook of that adventurous American who had first penetrated this unknown world. He described the Iguanodon, the pterodactyl, the huge and ferocious bird, the phororachus, and the great elk. It was not, however, until he sketched the mysteries of the central lake that the full interest and enthusiasm of the audience were aroused. In cold, measured tones he spoke of the monstrous three-eyed fish lizards, the huge water snakes, and the extraordinary colony of anthropoid apes, which came nearer than any known form to that hypothetical creation, the missing link. Professor Summerley wound up a most memorable address with an account of the methods by which the committee did at last find their way back to civilization. It had been hoped that the proceedings would end there, and that a vote of thanks and congratulations, moved by Professor Sergius of Uppsala University, would be duly seconded and carried. But symptoms of opposition had been evident from time to time during the evening, and now Dr. James Illingworth of Edinburgh rose to move an amendment. Dr. Illingworth began by expressing his high appreciation of the scientific work both of Professor Challenger and of Professor Summerlee. At the last meeting, he continued, Professor Challenger made certain assertions which had been queried by Professor Summerlee. Now Professor Summerlee came forward himself with the same assertions and expected them to remain unquestioned. Was this reasonable? The corroboration of these wondrous tales was really of the most slender description. What did it amount to? Some photographs? Was it possible that in this age of ingenious manipulation, photographs could be accepted as evidence? What more? We have a story of a flight and a descent by ropes, which precluded the production of larger specimens. It was ingenious, but not convincing. At this point, Amid some uproar, the chairman directed Dr. Illingworth to bring his remarks to a conclusion to move his amendment. Dr. Illingworth. I move, then, that while Professor Summerlee be thanked for his interesting address, the whole matter shall be regarded as non-proven, and shall be referred back to a larger and possibly more reliable committee of investigation. It is difficult to describe the confusion caused by this amendment. A large section of the audience expressed their indignation at this slur upon the travellers with cries of, Withdraw! Turn him out! On the other hand, the malcontents cheered for the amendment with shouts of, Order! And fair play! A scuffle broke out on the back benches, and blows were freely exchanged among the medical students in that part of the hall. Suddenly there was a pause, a hush, and then... Complete silence. Professor Challenger was on his feet. As he raised his hand for order, the whole audience settled down expectantly to give him a hearing. It will be within the recollection of many present, said Professor Challenger, that similar foolish and unmannerly scenes marked the last meeting at which I have been able to address them. On that occasion, Professor Summerlee was the chief offender, 
and though he is now chastened and contrite, the matter could not be entirely forgotten. I have heard tonight similar but even more offensive sentiments from the person who has just sat down, and though it is a conscious effort of self-effacement to come down to that person's mental level, I will endeavour to do so, in order to allay any reasonable doubt which could possibly exist in the minds of anyone. Laughter and interruption here. Our cameras have been tampered with by the ape-men, and most of our negatives ruined. Cheers, laughter, and tell us another. I have mentioned the ape-men, and cannot forbear from saying that some of the sounds which now meet my ears bring back most vividly my experiences with those interesting creatures. Laughter. In spite of the destruction of so many valuable negatives, there are still in our collection corroborative photographs showing the conditions of life upon the plateau, forged, and considerable interruption which ended in several men being put out of the hall. Professor Challenger continued, Under the conditions of our escape, it was naturally impossible to bring a large amount of baggage, but we did rescue Professor Summerlee's collection of butterflies and beetles, containing many new speeches. Is this not evidence? No! From several voices. Dr. Illingworth, rising. Our point is that such a collection might have been made in other places than a prehistoric plateau. Applause. Professor Challenger. No doubt, sir. We have to bow to your scientific authority, although I must admit that the name is unfamiliar. Passing, then, both the photographs and the entomological collection, I come to the varied and accurate information which we bring with us upon points which have never before been elucidated. For example, upon the domestic habits of the pterodactyl. A voice. Bosh! And uproar. I say that upon the domestic habits of the pterodactyl we can throw a flood of light. I can exhibit to you from my portfolio a picture of that creature taken from life which would convince you, Dr. Illingworth. No picture could convince us of anything, Professor Challenger. You would require to see the thing itself, Dr. Illingworth. Undoubtedly, Professor Challenger. And you would accept that. Dr. Illingworth, laughing, beyond a doubt. It was at this point that the sensation of the evening arose. A sensation so dramatic that it can never have been paralleled in the history of scientific gatherings. Professor Challenger raised his hand in the air as a signal. And at once our colleague, Mr. E.D. Malone, was observed to rise and to make his way to the back of the platform. An instant later, he reappeared in the company of a gigantic negro, the two of them bearing between them a large, square packing case. It was evidently of great weight, and was slowly carried forward and placed in front of the professor's chair. All sound had hushed in the audience, and everyone was absorbed in the spectacle before them. Professor Challenger drew off the top of the case, which formed a sliding lid. Peering down into the box, he snapped his fingers several times and was heard from the press seat to say, Come then, pretty, pretty, in a coaxing voice. An instant later, with a scratching, rattling round, a most horrible and loathsome creature appeared from below and perched itself upon the side of the case. Even the unexpected fall of the Duke of Durham into the orchestra, which occurred at this moment, could not distract the petrified attention of the vast audience. The face of the creature was like the wildest gargoyle that the imagination of a mad medieval builder could have conceived. It was malicious, horrible, with two small red eyes as bright as points of burning coal. Its long, savage mouth, which was held half open, was full of a double row of shark-like teeth. Its shoulders were humped, and round them were draped what appeared to be a faded grey shawl. It was the devil of our childhood in person. There was a turmoil in the audience. Someone screamed, 
Two ladies in the front row fell senseless from their chairs, and there was a general movement upon the platform to follow their chairman into the orchestra. For a moment there was danger of a general panic. Professor Challenger threw up his hands to still the commotion, but the movement alarmed the creature beside him. Its strange shawl suddenly unfurled, spread, and fluttered as a pair of leathery wings. Its owner grabbed at its legs, but too late to hold it. It had sprung from the perch and was circling slowly round the Queen's Hall with a dry, leathery flapping of its ten-foot wings while a putrid and insidious odour pervaded the room. The cries of the people in the galleries who were alarmed at the near approach of those glowing eyes and that murderous beak excited the creature to a frenzy. Faster and faster it flew, beating against walls and chandeliers in a blind frenzy of alarm. The window! For heaven's sake, shut that window! roared the professor from the platform, dancing and wringing his hands in an agony of apprehension. Alas, his warning was too late. In a moment, the creature, beating and bumping along the wall like a huge moth within a gath shade, came upon the opening, squeezed its hideous bulk through it, and was gone. Professor Challenger fell back into his chair with his face buried in his hands, while the audience gave one long, deep sigh of relief as they realized that the incident was over. Then their exuberance united to make a wave of enthusiasm which swept over the orchestra and carried the four heroes away upon its crest. Everyone was on his feet. The crowd, bearing the four travelers aloft, made for the door. Out in the street, a roar of acclamation from a hundred thousand voices greeted the four adventurers as they appeared. A procession! A procession! was the cry. And in a dense phalanx the crowd set forth, taking the route of Regent Street, Pall Mall, St. James's Street, and Piccadilly. The whole central traffic of London was held up, and it was not until after midnight that the four travellers were released at the entrance to Lord John Roxton's chambers in Albany. So ended one of the most remarkable evenings that London has seen for a long time. So far, my friend Macdonough, and it may be taken as a fairly accurate, if florid, account of the proceedings. One word as to the fate of the London pterodactyl. Nothing can be said to be certain upon this point, there is the evidence of two frightened women that it perched upon the roof of the Queen's Hall and remained there like a diabolical statue for some hours. The next day it came out in the evening papers that Guardsman Miles of the Coldstream Guards, on duty outside Marlborough House, had deserted his post without leave and was therefore court-martialed. Guardsman Miles' account that he dropped his rifle and took to his heels down the mall because on looking up he had suddenly seen the devil between him and the moon, was not accepted by the court, and yet it may have a direct bearing upon the point at issue. The only other evidence which I can adduce is from the log of the SS Friesland, a Dutch-American liner, which asserts that at nine next morning, start point being at the time ten miles upon their starboard quarter, they were passed by something between a flying goat and a monstrous bat, which was heading at a prodigious pace south and west. If its homing instinct led it upon the right line, there can be no doubt that somewhere out in the wastes of the Atlantic, the last European pterodactyl found its end. And Gladys. Oh, my Gladys. No letter or telegram had come to me at Southampton, and I reached the little villa at Streatham about ten o'clock that night in a fever of alarm. Was she dead or alive? Where were all my mighty dreams of the open arms, the smiling face, the words of praise for her man who had risked his life to humour her whim? Already I was down from the high peaks and standing flat-footed upon earth. Yet some good reasons given might still lift me to the clouds once more. I rushed down the garden path, hammered at the door, heard the voice of Gladys within, pushed past the staring maid and strode into the sitting-room. She was seated in a low settee under the shaded standard lamp by the piano. In three steps I was across the room and had both her hands in mine. Gladys, I cried, Gladys! She looked up with amazement in her face. She was altered in some subtle way. 
the expression of her eyes, the hard upward stare, the set of the lips, was new to me. She drew back her hands. What do you mean? she said. Gladys, I cried. What is the matter? You are my Gladys, are you not? Little Gladys Hungerton? No, said she. I am Gladys Potts. Let me introduce you to my husband. How absurd life is. I found myself mechanically bowing and shaking hands with a little ginger-haired man who was coiled up in the deep armchair which had once been sacred to my own use. We bobbed and grinned in front of each other. "'Will you answer a question?' I asked. "'Well, within reason,' said he. "'How did you do it? "'Have you searched for hidden treasure, "'or discovered a pole, "'or done time on a pirate, "'or flown the channel, or what? "'Where is the glamour of romance? "'How did you get it?' "'He stared at me with a hopeless expression "'upon his vacuous, good-natured, scrubby little face.' "'Don't you think all this is a little too personal?' he said. "'Well, just one question,' I cried. "'What are you? What is your profession?' "'I'm a solicitor's clerk,' said he. Second man at Johnson and Merivale's 41 Chancery Lane.' "'Good night,' said I, and vanished, "'like all disconsolate and broken-hearted heroes, "'into the darkness, with grief and rage and laughter,' all simmering within me like a boiling pot. One more little scene, and I have done. Last night we all supped at Lord John Roxton's rooms, and sitting together afterwards we smoked in good comradeship and talked our adventures over. It was strange under these altered surroundings to see the old well-known faces and figures. There was Challenger, with his smile of condescension, his drooping eyelids, his intolerant eyes, his aggressive beard, his huge chest swelling and puffing as he laid down the law to Summerlee. And Summerlee, too. There he was, with his short briar between his thin moustache and his grey goat's beard. His worn face protruded in eager debate as he queried all challengers' propositions. Finally, there was our host with his rugged eagle face and his cold blue glacier eyes, with always a shimmer of devilment and of humour down in the depths of them. Such is the last picture of them that I have carried away. It was after supper, in his own sanctum, the room of the pink radiance and the innumerable trophies, that Lord John Roxton had something to say to us. From a cupboard he had brought an old cigar-box, and this he laid before him on the table. "'There's one thing,' said he, "'that maybe I should have spoken about before this, "'but I wanted to know a little more clearly where I was. "'No use to raise hopes and let them down again, "'but it's facts, not hopes, with us now. "'You may remember that day we found the pterodactyl rookery in the swamp, what? "'Well, something in the lie of the land took my notice. "'Perhaps it has escaped you, so I will tell you. "'It was a volcanic vent full of blue clay.' "'The professors nodded.' Well, now, in the whole world, I've only had to do with one place that was a volcanic vent of blue clay. That was the great De Beers diamond mine of Kimberley, what? So, you see, I got diamonds into my head. I rigged up a contraption to hold off those stinking beasts, and I spent a happy day there with a spud. This is what I got. He opened his cigar box, and tilting it over... He poured about twenty or thirty rough stones, varying from the size of beans to that of chestnuts, on the table. Perhaps you think I should have told you then. Well, so I should. Only I know there are a lot of traps for the unwary, and that stones may be of any size, and yet of little value, where colour and consistency are clean off. Therefore, I brought them back, and on the first day at home I took one round to Spinks, and asked him to have it roughly cut and valued. He took a pillbox from his pocket and spilled out of it a beautiful, glittering diamond. One of the finest stones that I have ever seen. There's the result, said he. He prices the lot at a minimum of two hundred thousand pounds. Of course, it is fair shares between us. I won't hear of anything else. Well, Challenger, what will you do with your fifty thousand? If you really persist in your generous view, said the professor, 
I should found a private museum, which has long been one of my dreams. And you, Samily? I would retire from teaching and so find time for my final classification of the chalk fossils. I'll use my own, said Lord John Roxton, in fitting out a well-formed expedition and having another look at the dear old plateau. As to you, young fellow, you, of course, will spend yours in getting married. Not just yet, said I, with a rueful smile. I think, if you will have me, that I would rather go with you. Lord John Roxton said nothing, but a brown hand was stretched out to me across the table.